thought on that. Uh, Anthony, isn't that uh, connected, that symbol there, connected in circuitry or something? Um, the, the zigzagging, is that like ohms or resistance or something in circuit boards or something? I, it just jumped out at me. I'm not really sure. I, I've seen it somewhere. Yeah, I'm not sure which um, schematic that refers to, but it sure makes sense to me from an electric universe model standpoint that they would be trying to reconnect all of the planets because in the original, in the golden age, when we had the alignment of Saturn, Venus, and Mars to Earth in close proximity in a direct line, there was that plasma electric connection. They don't have the ability technologically or spiritually to realign the planets and I've consulted with a couple of people this week on this theory but what I'm going to put forth here is they don't have the ability to realign the planets back into that configuration that you were showing Chris however they do have the technology to recreate the electrical pathways mm -hmm. thus recreating that symbol that you just showed as a schematic so that's our premise that we've been working off of, uh, looking at series, the uh, points on series, uh, the uh, uh, the dawn mission, and all those things. They align; uh, they're getting their alignments down and measuring them and things like that. That's correct, and that's where the adiabatic quantum computer comes into play to predict in that alignment in terms of time and geometry, and also being able to establish and maintain the portals. And I, if you want to go back to that schematic, to that graphic again of the lightning pathway, Chris, um, yeah. What essentially, you, you know what the planets are in the numbers. That's numerically um, arranged there. But you know which planets are which according to those numbers. But that is essentially what CERN is going to do is create that plasma conduit by connecting each of those planets in series, and there you go with the, you know, the uh, dwarf planet series. But series electrically is S E R I E S, and the dwarf planet is a different spelling, C E R E S. But anyway, it's a play on words. But I think this is something that I really would like people to highlight from a physics standpoint, as well as the spiritual, as well as the mythological. Is this is the key to CERN right here, in my opinion? <laughs> that's a that's a dog star. That's the dog star. That's the dog star. Sirius just came in. That that was a planned event, folks. Thank you, thank you for that. But I think that if people will keep this image in their mind as they're trying to put together all the pieces of the physics and the mythological and the spiritual, this is really revealing the hidden agenda at CERN right here. Chris, you've nailed it again. Yeah, that's amazing. This, uh, this really is the picture of what we're kind of trying to describe with the physics of CERN and yep. the, uh, the objective. And the 369 aspect that Chris has been focusing on, or the that's the key, as Tesla or somebody said, I believe. Was that Tesla? Tesla. Yep. Three, the 369 there? Um, if, you, if you understand the relationships and significance of 369, then you hold the key to the universe. Mm. And the accurate model of the universe is the electric model, not the gravitational. <clears throat> and what we know in school from physics and basic science is based on or upon the gravitational model. That's the false model that's been put forth. The real model is all about electricity. And there it is right there. Isn't it amazing that education, I mean I'm being a little bit, but it's, a, it's a basically misdirection for the uninformed or the, uh, the non uh, what do they call? What's their term that they like to use? The non-elite, I guess. Uh, right. It's all misdirection, and and it's just atrocious to contemplate people's lives being misdirected intentionally, and uh, it really just peeves you when you think of yeah. it. And that goes to where people who are presented information like this, who don't have the awareness of what has been hidden 
and and we're only scratching the surface, the three of us here. But let's take quote the average person out there. When presented information like this, typically they want to disavow it. They want to shut it down. They want to say that it's just mythological. It has no application to the present time. And there is the proof that the deception through the education system has been successful through multiple generations. And that's why we have such a tough time struggling with the average person on the street to, quote, awaken them is because they want to go back to their norm. They want to stay in their paradigm because that's comfortable, that's familiar, and that's safe. But when you try to change that paradigm for them, understandably, this is not a this is not a, a piece of judgment or proclamation of judgment against anyone. It's simply an irrational observation of how people do not want to move out of their comfort zone and look at a different paradigm because it, it rattles their cage. They become fearful first, and then they reject it. And if they do not intellectually have an open mind, they shut it down and they go back into their box. And that's what the powers that be want. Right. They, want it, they want a two-class system, a system of the illuminated with this knowledge who are intellectually aware and a larger subclass of surf slaves who do not know what is really going on in the world, what the reality is. And our mission is to scratch the surface and reveal what the reality is. Yeah, from the uh, psychological background that I have, when I just look at this and I think of it and I, I look at it is most people have a lack of critical thinking skills. They do not have, they're in a passive mindset. They do not have that ability to or the desire to think analytically and to dissect and to research and to, as we like to say, go down the rabbit holes. Most people will stop at the door. They won't unlock it and go in. Yeah, because the, the, the gatekeepers are saying that's a conspiracy theory which makes the switch flip on to say, ooh, that's naughty or that's bad and I don't want to be a tin hat. You get this construct, a tin hat wearing crazy person, when they say conspiracy theory. It's an image that's been built and inserted in people's minds. So it says, don't question. Don't question or you're wearing a tin hat. Go along with Bill O'Reilly and every stupid thing he says. You know. So that's... Now, in your, your world of psychology, and we'll let Chris get back in here real quick, but in your world of psychology and your counseling that you do, you've heard the... Um, the word or the phrase trigger words mm -hmm. and when you place the words conspiracy theorist that label on someone that's a trigger yep. for the person who then says oh okay I know everything about that person that you just labeled a conspiracy theorist I know what they think I know what they believe they're complete idiots they're kooks they're right. wackos right and those that's an that's a example of how people are triggered by words to then shut down. Right. These are the what I call constructs. It's a it's a stop right there. Do you remember the image that I showed you of the cross section of the main yeah. beam pipe? Yeah. Is that is that where you're going? No. I don't want to no, we, we did show that on our show before, though, that picture that you sent. It's inside right. of the, it's the main hadron collider, right? Is that what you yep. said? These Anything? are the two beam lines. Those are the two beam yeah. lines. That's exactly the beam lines and the magnets surrounding them and the magnetic force fields, the lines of magnetic force around those. Absolutely, totally exact. Yeah, this is, um, focus on these eyes, and here's the bull's eye. You know why people say bull, illuminate, I guess. And, and, that's um, the same, and that's the same toroidal field that makes up our magnetosphere, our shields around the Earth, exactly the same. Yeah, so when we, when Tim and I and you get all done with our show. Hold on, I have to jump in. If you look at the particle accelerator at CERN, 
as well as all of the other round circular particle accelerators around the world. If you look at the symbol for the advanced light source building at Berkeley as one example, all of the synchrotron particle accelerators look exactly like that diagram of the pyramid which represents the interior of the pyramid, the spiral ramping, the pathways, the walkways, those are the beam lines within the synchrotrons which is exactly the same as the pathways inside the pyramid. Things I just I'm just curious where it is in these photos when we get these layouts. I suspect it's over closer to Atlas because that's where the head the headquarters offices are, are located. So mm. I I think that's where the uh, their uh, museum of science and technology, the sphere, the wooden sphere, mm -hmm. which you're speaking of in terms of its relationship to Tesla's Wycliffe Tower, the right. half sphere, the half dome at the top of that. So, yeah, I think that's where that's located. But it's a guess at this point. Great question. I'll find out. Okay, great. Um, okay, you, have, you have the two pillars, but you also have the fact that Samson separated the two pillars, and that is representing the opening of the portal, the separating of the um, particles that they call WIMPs, the weakly interacting massive particles, being separated, thus creating the opening for the portal. So when you look at Hercules and you look at his separating of the, of the ocean, or separating of the mountains to create the opening into the Mediterranean, you're looking at the same thing that CERN is going to do with physics. Yeah, except I think, in my opinion... Look at this putting on the glasses of the electric universe model. What you're seeing are plasma discharges. What you see with the two pillars, think of one being the positive charged pillar and the other one being the negative. And when you have positive and negative, you have the ability to establish a current, a connection. When you talk about the energy from the sun and the energy from the cosmos and the energy affecting earthquakes, you're talking about particles that have been accelerated because they're moving through an electric universe. When you have an electrical current and you, in, you introduce particles into an electric field, you then generate, the, you cause the particles to accelerate, but you also cause magnetic fields to be generated around those particles. So if the particles are moving in a, in a stream, around the stream you have magnetic lines of force. So when you talk about connecting the energy between the sun and the earth, the connecting the energy between the planets and the cosmos, and that energy causing earthquakes like the New Madrid earthquake, you're talking about particles that have been accelerated, huge magnetic forces, the connecting of those electrical charges, all of that coming together. So when you speak of energy, you're talking about electricity. And that's electricity between the planets, between the sun and the earth. And that is why they're so focused on aligning everything. Because you have to get all of the different polarities and all of the different pillars, all of the points of energy, if you will, the positives and the negatives to line up so that you can establish that line of current. It's like throwing a switch. If you don't have the wires connecting to one another, you don't have current. So you have to have your source and you have to have your receiver. You have to have everything plugged in is what I'm saying. Everything's getting plugged in in September, and they're going to throw the switch. Mm. Yeah, um, and then, you know, in history, the... Yeah, the, fir the first collisions will take place either the last week of May or the first week of June. They haven't pinpointed exactly what day, but I think we can figure it out ourselves. But then the highest power will be derived in September. With the, the ring at the bottom is the, um, the last particle accelerator before the main ring. And so oh that, is bringing the part that is bringing yeah, the particles Yeah, I didn't even realize that. Yeah, I thought actually underneath it also. 
No, no. What, I, what I'm saying is that represents that represents that last synchrotron prior to the main ring, and what you're it, the fact that it's inside or outside is irrelevant in the layout, okay. but it just gotcha. represents that. If you look at the two arms that branch out from that. From that small circle, if you look at the two arms that branch out and touch the, that main ring, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. on the left and right, go up, go up higher with your pointer. They, to the right and left. Okay, go to left. Go to the left or right. No, not there. Not up above. No. Up to the left. Come to the well, edge here? of the ring. No, no, down no, below. Come no. down just a little bit. To the that little arm. arms that are in between that the circles. The arms between yeah, I the see them right here. No, no, these up, two. no, not outside, outside. These two? Outside, yeah, outside. Right yes, yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> the only reason I point those out is because that is how they they move the particles from the last accelerator into the main ring. In the last accelerator, all the particles are rotating together in one direction. Then uh -huh. they have to redirect them to the main ring in opposing directions. Those uh -huh. are the two injectors. Those oh, are the I two see right here. B particle injectors. Right. Going in the, going in the opposite the, directions. Yeah. There you go. Now they're going in opposite directions in the main wow. ring, and that larger ring in your picture is the main ring. Okay. Now wow. what you're looking at here in terms of the uh, the two pyramids that are intersecting there is the cross section of not only the main ring but the cross section of the of the particle detectors where the collisions occur within. So everything of CERN is represented right there. Wow. I think we got about twenty minutes, Chris. You had to stop in about twenty. Oh uh, probably thirty five, but oh, okay. Um Okay, go. No. So yeah, so we kind of you know touched a lot on this uh, ceremony that they did here. Um, here's uh, Albert Pike calling it the Blazing Star of Glory and stuff, and he talks about that in his book. But um, so on December twenty fifth, thirty one seventeen B.C., a total solar eclipse was visible at sunrise at the winter solstice point. That is during the time of Tammuz when they all cried when he died. And he was the bull god and the son of Nimrod. Uh, so in the era of the global dragon culture, this, I'm just saying that it was the same uh, date, was December 25th, and during this, I'm not sure if it's the same year about Tammuz, but um, same day, same solstice. Mm -hmm. This date is the beginning of the Mayan calendar. It is also the start of the reign of the Mesen, or the Minis, uh, the first feral king that united Egypt, which I do believe that he is Osiris. I'd like people to appreciate that there are, I want to say, approximately 150 synchrotron particle accelerators around the world, many versions of the Large Hadron Collider, all over the world, and they all produce synchrotron energy. They don't have the capability of opening the portal that the LHC does, but I think that they factor in as present-day versions of all of the ancient pyramids that are still being, to this day, discovered, uncovered, found beneath the oceans, underneath the ice, as the ice recedes. We're finding the upside down and the right side up pyramids, Tim, you alluded to this, all over the world. So what we're seeing with all of these synchrotron part particle accelerators are the replacements for the ancient pyramids. And those ancient pyramids were all stabilizing portals of different sizes and different durations of opening. And that's what we're seeing now with these other synchrotron particle accelerators. They will handle the smaller, shorter duration portals. CERN's going to have the fixed portal that will maintain that uh, dimensional access. Yeah. Hmm. That's why they're doing it during the equinoxes, just like they did when, yeah. on September 11th. That's what I really want to point out to people with that energy that they need. So they is need the electrical connections. Right. Yeah. So so is CERN actually the beanstalk for the giants to come down? Uh, it's yep. the main beanstalk, right? Yep. <laughs> it is. Well, you it's know, a great the, way to put it. Mm -hmm. The sons of Saturn, which are the giants, they're stuck in the netherworld, which is in between the parallel dimensions. 
and uh, and then you know the days of Noah. It's going to be you know the end times will be like the days of Noah, and there was a lot of giants then and after, and so that's what's going to happen uh, when they open open a portal. Is maybe that's why there was reports that they saw them uh, coming through or right. something like that during that time, but. This is a portal here, okay, so what I want to point out that's real important is that this is a portal. This is an unstable portal like it is now. It's unstable. Mm -hmm. We have black or whatever they are, portals or Markarian 421, and then we have uh, mm -hmm. uh, Tom Horn says that there is a black hole or something in, in the Milky Way that they used to travel in like a portal that's not open because they would smash, you know, the atoms would smash. And so with this being unstabilized like in these artifacts here, this is a significant thing for them because this is when they stabilized it here with the constellation Camelopardius. So this is like uh, stabilized and this is what they want to do. They can't go through the other side where there is another universe or where there is other things on the other side. They can't go through there right now because of they have to um, have a, the right uh, electric frequency going around in order to stabilize it so they can travel mm -hmm. through those portals and that's so right. um, yeah and so that's what they're they're trying that's one thing that they're doing here and that's why they have this here this is what they did here with the pyramids they were able to do that but over time they call this a giraffe this is a so uh, a, a, a serpapard, which is a snake, lion, leopard uh, kind of thing with the long necks. This was 3000 BC. This was Urek. Uh, it's also in Egypt, the same uh, thing. This is the uh, constellation called Camelopardalus. And uh, on, on one of our next shows, we're going to talk about Cephas, uh, how he's Khufu and the son of uh, Jupiter. And we'll connect all those things together with that because that's the key uh, to understanding a lot of these things too with the obelisk and the key and everything. So this uh, Rothschild giraffe is a Camelopardius. So the Rothschilds are the ones who have the red shield and they are the ones that are uh, tied to this. And so, um, so there were some living in the wild and here I guess there were some in Kenya where Obama was from, and so I think that's a little interesting there, but... It says the Roth, um, Rothschild's giraffe is a particular risk of hybridization. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. There's a lot of animals that are hybrids, you know, they've, mm -hmm. ma they've manipulated DNA uh, a lot, so... Um, so I wanted to point that out, you know, that they want to stabilize these portals mm -hmm. that that, w that we were talking about. And so the Rothschilds want their heir to the throne of Jacob, you know, th you know, through Jacob, uh, through that bloodline. That's important, and that's what this war is all. This is what this war is all about. Um, this is what they want you uh, to not know. You know, they don't want you to know the truth and what's going on. These are spiritual wars. But this is Cephas. He represents Khufu and these are the Titans. This is Ursa Minor and this is Draco. Thuban is around this area that used to be the Pole Star but now uh, Juno which is Isis is the Pole Star now. And and then here we have Ursa Major. So Camelopardius and Ursa Major wrapped around this perfect way uh, back in history, and they opened up this North Star, which was Thuban at that time. Hmm. That's my understanding, anyway. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, that's just, you know, from my research and, right. and my understanding. So we're looking here at this portal and a portal opening um, up and being stabilized so that way, you know, they can go through. And so when we look at the top of the uh, tree, we're also talking about our our minds here in a way because you know that's what the occult talk about they mm -hmm. they represent this with the mind it's because they don't have a soul you know so they have to understand things uh, without God's understanding without the Holy Spirit because they turned evil and so what they want is your mind they want your mind they want your soul because that's connected to your soul and they want control of you they want your energy 
they want your life. You know, they want your blood. <laughs> These people uh, that, you know, Satan, he wants people to fall for the tricks of the world, of their system. And that's why Jesus said, you know, not to follow the patterns of the world. We are to follow Jesus Christ, and uh, he gives us the Holy Spirit. We don't need all of these other chakras or spirits or whatever that's going to fool us into believing we're going to Wonderland. You know, we only need Jesus Christ. That's all. That's the only one that, that we need because he is the gate. This is not the gate. <laughs> this yeah. is, that's why Satan fooled everybody in the garden because uh, this is what he had before. He had Saturn, Venus, and Mars, and Earth, and he had this control in this connection here. But Jesus came, and he died on the cross, and he shed his blood. He was an atonement for our sins, and he rose again. And he did this for us, and he sent his Holy Spirit and many gifts to people that uh, belong to him. And so this is what this is all about. This is spiritual warfare. Uh, we are in these times to when uh, all of these things are happening. And I think that even pe for people that have a hard time understanding these things, if they continue just to take their time at their own pace to understand some things mm -hmm. like I did, I think that they'll eventually understand a lot of things and uh, get them and ask God to show them things and reveal things to them. <laughs> And yeah. If you just look at this picture that you have highlighted, uh, I think of the saints. When you th see the saints, you see a body, and then you see the halo. And this depiction that you have here is almost of that in an abstract way to me. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of one of those things of all the chakras lined up and the halo. Um, and what you were talking about also is a whole other show just, just on energy vampirism. Uh, the matrix and the, the you know being the batteries to the for the spirits, uh, the whole vampirism, soul energy, soul vampirism, psychic energy, uh, crazy stuff. But go ahead. Yeah. Is, is this image what they're trying to get back to? Yeah, that's what I wanted you to ask Dave with the Thunderbolts is because I I know that they have that rigged up system like we discussed in our shows about the resurrected Saturn, uh, which was right. Sobek. And um, and so with that bloodline of Tubal Cain. And, and so I know that the pole star was different and there was a different connection during back then during that time, obviously, because the pole star is a way different star now. The Polarius star is not the same star that it was then. It's a different star. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking that there was a different type of connection during that time. See, it just uh, of course, you know, there was. It just makes me think of yoga, that everybody's getting conditioned to do yoga and get their, get their inner uh, interstellar system aligned with this extrastellar system that they're trying to line humans with this, what they call a consciousness and all that, uh, collective consciousness, the hive mind. It just, it's the as above, so below stuff again, but in, within the person, you know, this whole yoga, yoking this to this, and that's the way I'm thinking about it. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, ahead, of course, it, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hello? Can yes. you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're preparing everybody, and if you take a step back and you look at everything that they've done through uh, Project Paperclip, uh, through the television, the creating, creating the uh, the Wi-Fi, they had all of this back then. Mm -hmm. You know, they had, um, you know, during even way back then, they had like electricity and bathrooms and. Plumbing. They had everything that we had and Wi-Fi and connections. They had way more technology than that. And so on our next show, I want to talk. I want to show all the ships that they had. They had um, all the artifacts. They had ships and uh, different things that they used back then as well. And so over time, of course, uh, things happened. And that's a lot to understand. You know, from there to then. I mean, how did that happen? And we've explained before that it all started then through their satanic system, through the Ogdode. That's why they worship the eight, and that's why they worship the uh, the. Uh, right. I I'd like to just say that I would like people to take this very seriously, in the sense that 
it's easy to set this aside as mythological, as ancient times, ancient studies, um, as our buddies in Scotland like to say, the woo-woo. Mm -hmm. And yet, this is not us just making things up. This is not fairy tale stuff. We're not just pulling this out of our heads, out of the ether, as perhaps Mr. Tesla would say. This is real information that we're presenting here. This is factual. This is based on real study from real sources. And we are being led to connect the dots. It doesn't mean that we're anything special apart from anyone else. It just means that this is what we're called to do and this is what our focus is. And so when I say that this is serious, I mean we're quickly putting all the pieces together to achieve the clarity regarding September. And, you know, again, it's one of those trigger words. People hear someone talk about a date or a time frame, and immediately they want to label you as a nutcase. How do you know? How can you set dates? How can you see the future? Nobody can do that. Well, we're not trying to be prophets, and we're not trying to set hard and fast dates, but I think that you would have to agree that there's an awful lot that is, as I like to call, the confluence of timelines and subjects and history and physics all coming together towards September. And I'll stop there. I would love to know, uh, just from what we unraveled here, the 369 aspect of, of, uh, of what we're dealing with this year, what 6 actually represents uh, for June, uh, what the 3 represented and what the 9 represents, uh, since they seem to be following that pattern. We're to look at the heavens for us in, in June you'll see what the six represents in terms of planetary alignments and when we talk about planetary alignments we're talking about the electrical alignments between the planets and then September is a, that's an easy one that's the nine but I think if you look a little deeper Chris in the constellations in terms of not just the equinoxes but the alignments with Polaris in June I think you will find the reason that they have chosen June for their first restart of collisions with CERN. Okay, and that amount of energy, there's mm -hmm. got to there's got to be an earthquake that day, in my opinion. You know? I agree with you. From a physics standpoint, I agree with you. With the electric universe model, yeah, things are lining up so that there's plenty of energy in September to have that happen. Yeah, and then we, you know, we have the Bible talks about wormwood, which is an angel, uh, you know, that's going to come down and plunge into the earth and. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's going to happen at some point. I don't know when. I mean, nobody really knows things that people need to understand. Yeah, again, borrowing from, from you know, Tim's background in, in counseling, it's better to have the information so that you're psychologically prepared to handle a crisis. It's much like in my previous life as a paramedic. If I didn't have the training and the ability to handle a crisis situation, I would be useless on an, the scene of an emergency. So if you are looking at perhaps a major earthquake coming in September, having this foreknowledge is going to give you that ability to handle that. I'm not talking about prepping with supplies and that type of thing. I'm talking about psychological prepping mm -hmm. so that you can handle whatever does happen to manifest in September. And that's a spiritual prepping and psychological prepping is much more important than physical prepping. I mean, that's that yeah, you got common sense. Thank you. Um, I was thinking of our friend Arthur C. Clarke, who has since passed on, and uh, his warnings about Europa, not to land on Europa. I think that was the moon, wasn't it? Yeah. Here. Sure. <laughs> well, I um, I got interested in this. About 15 years ago, I think, is when I really, <clears throat> pardon me, when I really uh, started to focus upon what was going on at CERN and with the LHC. And then, of course, as background, most everyone, I would imagine, has already heard of the Higgs boson, the God particle, as the media labeled it, not science. But in a nutshell, there's something of a smokescreen going on when people are hearing or talking about uh, the Higgs boson. 
really what I cut to the chase in is moving on to strangelets and those are a subset of bosons. Um, it is a quark, it is a combination of quarks and gluon particles uh, that are essentially smaller than the Higgs boson itself. And I always try to preface things by just cutting to the chase and then we can go and fill in the background. But that's really in terms of particle science, that's what they're focused on, are strangelets and the production of them. And we'll get into why and, and what their purpose is. But of course, the big attention that is drawn by media and by people in general is the discussion of opening of a portal. And that sounds very science fiction, very, uh, I don't know, I, I'm a make-believe, if you will. And yet, my studies over the last 15 years and especially in the last three years have confirmed to me that indeed a hyperdimensional portal will be opened and then the question was is that earth-based is it a terra based or are we reaching out into outer space and that's where I'd like you guys to fill in regarding Saturn and the hexagonal portal at the North Pole I'm a, I think we're both up to speed, all three of us on this, I should say. Um, we're, we're drawing from the same material. We're, I think, of reaching the same conclusions at the same time. I think what I tend to really focus on is the physics of what's going on. And the purpose for focusing on the physics, for me at least, is to look for the clues. Um, oftentimes, I think that the feedback I get from people when they hear about the occult and they hear about the ancient Sumerians and they hear about the, the ancient Sanskrits I think their eyes tend to glaze over and it's too intangible and it's too fairy tale-ish for a lot of people I'm not discounting what you're saying I'm in total agreement with what you're saying um, I try to put the science to what's going on so that it becomes a tangible something that people can say okay this is real this is really what the physicists are doing whoever it happens to be that's speaking about that if it's me or other people um, then they can say okay what this guy is saying or what this lady is saying is real and tangible I can buy into this and that will hopefully prompt people to do some more investigation and study on their own. And that's really what I'm doing is putting those pieces out there and saying, look at this deeper on your own. Use your own discernment, use your own intellect and curiosity, and go after it. I'm not here to spoon feed science to people because I'm not a physicist. But what I do have the ability to do, I think, is to make things intuitively understandable for the layperson. I'm a mediator. I'm between the physicist on one extreme and the layperson on the other extreme. And bringing the two together and saying, examine the science. I've distilled it down into something that's a little more understandable, again, intuitively understandable. Now go. Go research it on your own. Yeah. Go ahead and fill me in on that because I've looked at most of the colliders that exist in the world. Oh, I have yeah. heard of the leaf, but not in terms of the DNA project. My focus was with the genome lab in Walnut Creek, California, right adjacent to University of California at Berkeley with their synchrotron collider. And also that is adjacent to Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Um, that genome project there is what led me to my studies of the third strand of DNA. But please fill me in on the uh, Alif. I'd like to hear where are they using a particle collider to examine the proteins of DNA? Alrighty, great. Okay. There he is. Oh, I'm so glad you're back, Anthony. <laughs> yeah, you asked me about the third strand. Right. Um, yeah, third strand, what it means to people right now today in their daily life is the mark of the beast. Um, 
it's my conclusion that whether you're accepting a vaccine, demanding a vaccine, put in a FEMA camp and injected, however it ends up being introduced, or whether it's a vaccine or another form of transmission, there are many theories out there in terms of uh, aerosolized spraying of the atmosphere, so-called chemtrails. Did, did I just lose you again? No, we're, well, I'm here. And Chris, you're here, right? Okay, there we go. All right. To cut to the chase, because um, I know our time's limited, third strand is a control agent. Um, it will modify the DNA that exists in your body once it's introduced. Um, it serves not only as an internal modifier, but as a control mechanism. The third strand is composed of silicon, same as a computer transistor. Uh, it is coated in a nano-thin coating of gold to increase its uh, surface area in order to impart the maximum amount of digital information onto that third strand. <clears throat> Pardon me. The third strand with that digital information then internally modifies our DNA and it continues through the replication process. Um, it also is controlled <clears throat> Pardon me. Controlled by the outside influence of electromagnetic signals, be they microwave or otherwise, they can be produced and transmitted by HARP, by um, satellites, by cell towers, um, a number of remote um, sources, local remote remote sources. The nub of the issue is to control us to dumb us down even more than has happened already with the population and essentially create a surf class, S-E-R-F, a surf class of people. You know the Georgia Guidestones and that they indicate a reduction of the population to 500 million. That essentially will be the surf class, the slave class for society to do the bidding of what people want to call the elite. So that, in a nutshell, is why the third strand was developed. This is all information that is public. Anyone can find it. But that's the purpose of it. So I'll stop there. OK. I have seen those at CERN. Um, I think it is part of their ritual. There obviously is a demonic ritualistic process that is taking place that is an adjunct to the hard science when you're looking at the fact that the monkeys are considered sacred in India, there's a reason why they're considered sacred. There's also, in terms of vibration, because of the universe, all matter vibrates, energy vibrates. You take energy down to a lower level and you have solid matter. When you speak of the language or you speak of the symbolism, you're speaking of essentially recreating a vibration that they have found to be a key. Part of it is external to the world, to our universe, but it is also a key that affects our bodies in opening the third eye, as it is known in that culture more predominantly than ours. When we speak of symbols, whether they're broadcast in the media or they're located at CERN itself, the symbols are things that are then internalized when you read it, um, that you pray about in your own form, occultic form. It is also something that you verbalize and therefore create vibrations that have an effect upon the environment. I think it all ties together to the opening of the portal in terms of not only creating massive amounts of energy derived from the collision of particles, the energy itself, of course, being a vibration, but they are also using us as humans to create a vibration to enhance that collision-derived energy in the collider itself. They all work together. I think the vibrations that we produce, and I'm not a New Ager, but in terms of certain occultic practices verbalizing those rituals, those prayers, then affects people personally, whereas the collider is affecting the environment as a whole with the energy that it's producing. It has to physically 
move particles apart in the matrix and the movie has borrowed that for their title but that's not the real matrix it is the Higgs field which is composed of what are called WIMPs and these are heavy particles that are slow moving with low energy but they're physically moving those particles apart with the energy that's created in the collider at the time of these collisions that's where the portal is when the portal opens I believe they'll be verbalizing from those symbols those things that will affect humans individually I think that's to prepare the bodies as host bodies for the spirits that will come through that Higgs field opening so it's a matter of those documents those symbols those rituals preparing the body as a vessel and again I'm not a new ager I'm not an occultist but when I look at the physics and I look at our bodies in relation to the machine they're all interconnected because we're part of the same universe but the body has to be prepared and that plays in with the third strand of DNA being physically manipulated I'm gonna jump to the synchrotrons real quickly those are particle accelerators on a smaller scale than than CERN the multiple particle accelerators and Tim you sent me the one about the one in Jordan which is called and I love this sesame okay open um, sesame. <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> the purpose of all of these synchrotrons and I'm gonna focus on Berkeley is to conduct a number of small-scale experiments at small lower levels and then they feed that information to CERN CERN becomes its receptacle of all of these other experiments conducted throughout the world at the advanced light source building at UC Berkeley the synchrotron among many other things that they do with it focused on DNA and they were able to go down to the quantum level of our DNA and be able to reconstruct models of our DNA our proteins three-dimensionally so that they could understand that they're in there they are tied with the genome project the mapping of our genome which is now extrapolated out to the mapping of our minds um, so that they understand how to prepare the vessel and I know you guys have a lot of questions I'm gonna stop right there from a physics standpoint there is a connection between CERN and the center of the earth in the form of the production of strangelets strangelets are the heaviest known particle to science and they have the unique capability of falling as it's described gravitationally attracted to the center of the earth there is nothing that will prevent them I'm sure that most people have heard of neutrinos neutrinos pass right through our bodies right through the earth uninhibited and they move at near light speed picture a, a strange lid as having that same capability as a neutrino and falling to the uh, the core of the earth that's one of the reasons that they are producing strangelets is to open the bottomless pit is to physically penetrate to the core of the earth now this is going to sound really way out there but part of their process in having strangelets is to create a new environment for a new race of beings they wish to terraform the planet to their own liking Satan has made no bones about the fact that he wants to kill God he needs his own army to do that and he wants to create his own version of heaven on earth if strangelets are produced in large enough quantities and given enough time they can actually change the earth into a neutron star now I don't believe that's gonna happen anytime soon and I don't believe we're gonna be around to see that happen but that's part of the goal part of the whole it issue of the uh, the bottomless pit well, so where did the strangelets come from where, do, where are strangelets from Ah, excellent question CERN <laughs> oh. and also from the Brookhaven lab in New York Brookhaven um, New York they have what is known as the relativistic heavy ion collider I mean, we've got all these colliders all over the world it's just amazing 
Yeah, I learned that from you. I had no idea. I thought there was one <laughs> collider, and when I read your material, I said, oh, my gosh, there's more than one collider um, in the world. So I, I guess, you know, and I guess Tim brought something up earlier about the timing of, of uh, when they're going to uh, start working, you know, revving up this thing again is in March, and it's during the uh, the black sack cloth sun. And then there's another time in September, uh, which is uh, during the end of the Shemitah year. And this is going to be the same exact day that the Pope is going to address Congress. And That's I just right. kind of wonder, is all of this connected with each other? They are all absolutely connected. I appreciate your research into the occult and into the ancient studies because that is how they time the activities at CERN. And yes, mm -hmm. the blood moons are tied into this. We mm -hmm. actually have three significant time frames this year and, and a lot of people want to know what's going on in terms of time. Is it going to happen tomorrow? Is it going to happen this year? Whatever that might be. Yes, um, we have March, we have May and we have September. September 23rd, 24th is what you're referring to. Tied in with the blood moons, tied in with the, um, uh, I'm just losing my train of thought here, Sukkot on the 28th. Um, we have a Feast of Trumpets that predate that. Um, Right, we have the September 13th is the Feast of Trumpets on 2015. The Sukkot is exactly. September 28th, and that's the fourth blood moon is the 28th, I think. But well, the, right. that September, that starts the Jubilee, year of Jubilee, and it ends right. September. Right, that's what you're looking at. There's the year of Jubilee is proclaimed on the 23rd, and the Pope right. does his address on the 24th. So right. And then we have the next blood moon on the 28th. So September wow. is highly occult, very key to what they're doing. And let me go back to the physics for a moment. March, we have what they can they call the startup, but that's a misnomer. They've been building up to, and I won't go into all of that because we're limited with time. We need to do more broadcasts together. Okay. Um, but March is when they will do the first collisions of particles. They will do another one in May at a higher level of power, and then in September, an even higher level of power. What I'm expecting to see in terms of power levels, and the power is generated when the particles collide with one another. It's not the power of the magnets generating power. A lot of people think it's the magnets. When they talk about reaching tera electron volts, that's the energy coming from the collisions. So in March, they will hit 7 TeV, tera electron volts. In March, or excuse me, in May, they will reach anywhere between 10 and 13 TeV. September, they will go to their maximum possible power, which is 14 plus TeV. What this translates to in terms of discussing strangelets we were talking about before is May. There's a threshold at which strangelets are produced. That is at 10 TeV. They will hit 10 to 13 TeV in May. If they produce strangelets in large quantities, then we will have some definite earth changes taking place. The Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider, RHC, at Brookhaven produced in June of this year, excuse me, in April of 2014, they produced small quantities of strangelets, which are now at the center of the Earth. In August, there was a paper published in which they openly stated that they had produced these strangelets, and yet when you talk to people at CERN about strangelets, they will deny it, <laughs> completely deny it, even though in 2010, 12, and 14, they published papers saying we have been producing in our previous experiments strangelets. So they will lie to you to your face while publishing papers saying, 
look at what we've accomplished. Um, so, time frames. If they are producing strangelets in May, they certainly will produce more in September. If we're talking about the portal, when do I believe that it will open? I think it's September. I think it's the 23rd or thereabouts in terms of their rituals and the Pope and their symbolism. Mm -hmm. And having all of the components together that they need, they have the power generated by the collisions, they have the strange lists that they need, and they have their symbols and their rituals and the astronomical alignments all pulling together and focusing on September. So I'll stop. Yeah. In terms of attracting celestial bodies to the planet? Yeah, like an asteroid, could it, could it, could it, could that CERN be so powerful? Is it like 10,000 suns? I mean, how powerful is CERN? Is it going, could it, sure. could it be that forceful? Because it's, it's connected to the celestial realms, it's underneath right. the Earth. And uh, when they set that up, is it very possible that it could attract something like that much of a force in order to hit the Earth? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And again, intuitively, to make it tangible for the audience, CERN will produce a magnetic field when they go to maximum power in September that is 100,000 times more powerful than the magnetosphere that surrounds our planet. The magnetosphere functions as a shield, much like in Star Trek. It is shielding us from gamma rays and other energies coming from outer space, coming from the sun most directly. What a CERN is going to do and has already been doing is affecting the magnetosphere. It's like taking two magnets and bringing them close to one another. When CERN is powered up, and I can show you when we do some more interviews, some more discussions, time frames where the magnetosphere has been, I hate to use the word, warped, because of Star Trek, but it's not creating a warp field. It is warping or changing the shape of those magnetic lines of force that surround the planet. They are, in essence, opening up the shields, lower the shields, bring the shields up, Scotty, whatever you want to call it. But they are taking down our shields, which then makes us vulnerable to what is coming towards the planet already. They're not attracting celestial bodies with CERN. It doesn't have that much power. However, they do have the ability to make us penetrable, allowing the shields to be opened and allow those things to strike the Earth. This is also when we go back to strangelets, strangelets attract matter to themselves. They're not a black hole, but I call them the cousin to the black hole. They don't have the same density and gravity as black holes, but they have that ability to attract other atoms to them. If they had sufficient quantities of strangelets and sufficient time, to work on the planet itself, then in that case it would attract other outside celestial bodies. But that's not going to be part of this scenario in September. It is the opening of the shields that will make us vulnerable to asteroids and meteorites and, you know, if it's planet Wormwood or planet X or whatever else may be coming in. And they know darn well what's coming in already. Mm -hmm. And you know that all of this yes. is being hidden, yes. whether you're talking planet X or anything else they are tracking everything and they're not telling us. So I'm going to stop because I'm dominating the conversation here. We're connected. We could spend hours talking about artificial intelligence and specifically the adiabatic quantum computer. Let me give you just a little snippet. First of mm -hmm. all, the quantum computer and CERN are directly connected. The quantum computer is essential to the opening of the portal. It is essential to the um, data, the interpretation of the data generated by the detectors, but it is much more than that. The adiabatic quantum computer, when it runs a computation, it actually inserts into another dimension. This is their own literature, and I'm not going to mention the manufacturer's name. People can find that themselves. They reach into another dimension with a combinatorial equation. 
where in that other dimension the answer is derived and then extracted back into our dimension. And they call it a black box programming or interface. <laughs> okay? A black cube is used as an interface between oh the two gosh. dimensions to insert Jeez. the equation and retrieve the answer to a 99.9% .9 factor of being correct. I'm being very brief here. There's a lot I can mm -hmm. give you. The little snippet of history. Back in 2010, this company on its public website said that by early 2015, they will have an artificially intelligent computer that will have the equivalent processing power of all of the human brains on the planet, over 7 billion pe people, 7 billion brains. Six months after they put that out in public domain, it was taken down. I captured that, and that's what's led into my first book, Covert Catastrophe, and leads into this. The issue here is that at a quantum level, they've already achieved the ability to open a portal using the computer. At a macro level, meaning the CERN machine, they will now use that computer to control the collisions and the energy to open the Higgs field on a macro level and allow Satan and his demonic entities to enter our domain. Same process, it's not a comp the solution to a computation that's coming through from another dimension, but spiritual entities. And I'm going to give you one more back step. We were talking about Berkeley, and then you mentioned the obelisks. You see Berkeley, my alma mater. There is an obelisk that stands right down the hill from the synchrotron collider at Berkeley. <laughs> It looks exactly like the obelisk that is in Washington, D.C., and in Egypt, and in the Vatican. It is in alignment with the synchrotron, the obelisk, Alcatraz Island, where there is a lighthouse, and the center point of the arches of the Golden Gate Bridge, and you know from a cult what Golden Gate infers, and aligns with the constellation Ursa Major, mm -hmm. the Big Dipper, from which we had a gamma ray burst occur that struck right at that point, and that is in my first book. So there's an awful lot going on on a bunch of different levels here, but I wanted to mention the obelisk to you because why is Berkeley, why is Silicon Valley, why is San Francisco, all of that concentrated in the San Francisco Bay Area where I grew up. In Star Trek, they have their headquarters in San Francisco. The manufacturer for the quantum computer is in Silicon Valley. The Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. There is so much going on in the Bay Area that it's just amazing from an occult standpoint. And I'll just back off from there for a moment. I have uh, right now at anthonypatch.com. That's Anthony and then patch.com. Um, 2048 Diamonds in the Rough, and also the first part, and it's only in a draft form because of the need to get this out quickly. Part one of three parts of the companion book that explains the hard science to 2048 Diamonds in the Rough. Um, the first book is undergoing some updates because I need to re release that as a proper prequel. And I will have that on the website in about two weeks' time. Yeah, I would echo what you're saying because um, I've been a Christian believer since age 16. I'm 61 now. Um, but I echo what you're saying in terms of being hit hard. And about five years ago, that, mm -hmm. that burning mm -hmm. impetus to start studying. And then a little over almost three years ago now, I've never written books before, but it was clearly evident to me that he wanted me to sit down and start writing. And he put a burning desire in there coupled with an enjoyment. I love creating the characters. The characters take mm -hmm. on their own storyline. <laughs> we can talk about that at another time. But it is clear that the Lord is calling us to mm -hmm. be spokespeople, spokespersons, to get this information out, not to scare people. We are not scaremongering anybody. I can tell by you guys 
already and I'm just meeting you. Our purpose is simply to ask people, look at what's going around, study it, examine it, determine what's happening. If you don't know the Lord, please turn to the Lord and ask him to be your savior to save you from what is coming if you want to look at it that way but also to develop that relationship with him and it'll bring that peace beyond any uh, any understanding so really that's really my purpose in writing the books it's not to make a bunch of money it's not to do anything except to be a good witness for him as a footnote to the book it is downloadable as a PDF both of those I did that on purpose because as you said, Tim, it is time-sensitive information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, well, you can't. Thank you. Um, as you both know, I like to cut to the chase, and then we'll backfill. We'll kind of build the story as we go. Um, it's readily apparent to me that DNA is a central component of the agenda with CERN. Uh, much of the distraction with CERN to the public has been to the portal, um, has to the Big Bang, the God particle. But I think what we really need to talk about today is the fact that they want to use artificial DNA to create an image of the beast from Scripture. And I'll rely upon the two of you to bring the relevant Scripture and, and, uh, and uh, information to the discussion beyond just the science that I want to uh, present. But I think people need to understand that CERN has a multifaceted program with the Large Hadron Collider. CERN is the location in Switzerland. The machine is the Large Hadron Collider. The machine has multiple purposes. And the purpose that I want to go over today is really the creation of a new being using DNA. It is a patterning of ancient DNA using modern technology in the construction of artificial DNA by creating the proteins and the amino acids that are necessary to create the what we're familiar with is the double helix pattern. They are going to build a triple helix pattern of artificial DNA to create an artificial being. It's just one of the slices to the Large Hadron Collider. Basically, it was very cryptic. He just said that now that they have found the God particle, meaning the Higgs boson, um, they need to find the spiritual particle. And my take on that is they have already found the spiritual particle. And that follows a pattern we've discussed before about hidden information and revelation of that information at certain times. But the in my research, we go to quantum physics. We go to the components that make up um, atoms, which essentially are quarks, gluons, muons, um, boson, which is a category of particles. And essentially, what I like to focus on, because I want people to be able to have something they can wrap their head around, something that's tangible that makes sense. And that is a combination of gluons and quarks and those are hard to get your head around so if you put quarks and gluons together you come up with what is known as a strangelet and we've talked about this a little bit before the unique thing about a strangelet is that it attracts other particles to it much like a black hole in that mechanism of attraction um, it's not gravitational. It is an atomic, um, what they call a weak interaction, the interaction between particles. Strange lits attract other particles. They attract atoms, and then they attract molecules, and so forth, so forth and so on. To cut to the chase, the strange lit, in my estimation, is the spiritual particle that the Vatican, the Pope, was speaking of. The reason for calling it the spiritual, even though it's larger than a quark and a gluon that you're bringing together to create a strangelet particle, is the fact that it does attract. It's this attraction that we can go on and discuss a little bit more about, 
that is the mechanism in which they will create the double helix of DNA. And that has, in the micro world, its application. But as we have always been talking about, so is above, so is below. There's a macro world of application to the double helix. And this goes to Saturn and it goes to Saturn and the Earth. And I'll, we'll backfill some of that information. I just don't want to overload people. But spirit particle, strange lit, attraction, building, DNA, the new beast, be it Horus, um, is really that slice of CERN that we're talking about today. I, if people have heard of black holes and it's in popular culture so it's easy for people to visualize a black hole with its gravity, its density, attracting light into it as they portrayed in the movies. The strange lit operates much the same way. It doesn't have the gravity due to density that a black hole has but it has the same type of mechanism in the sense of attracting things to it that a black hole does. Strange lits do not create black holes. Many years going back, four, five, six years, people were all up in arms about the Hadron Collider creating black holes and it was going to be the end of humanity. There's been some recent articles published about comments that, um, um, what's his name? I'm sorry, I'm thinking of the physicist, um, Stephen Hawking, talking about if they turn CERN on again this year, that it's going to potentially destroy the universe. He's being taken out of context. I want to sort of defend his comment a oh. little bit. The reason that he's made that comment was that if there was infinite energy available, then the world would be swallowed up, attracted to a black hole that would be created by the Large Hadron Collider, should it have access to infinite energy. It does not. That's the portion of the articles that they fail to present. They've taken his comments out of context. So let's go back. If you have infinite energy, you can create a black hole and you can destroy the universe. There is no infinite energy that is being accessed. Therefore, there's no destruction of the universe. And poor Stephen Hawking, he, he just gets beat up because he makes profound statements that people need to think about, but they're not looking at the whole statement. And so I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but it's important for people to understand, no, no black holes are going to be created. The planet is not going to be converted to a neutron star, which is the end result of the production of strange lits. Strange lits in the near term, the immediate future, its application is for this process of um, constructing the double helix and then the triple helix of DNA. That's referring back to my first book, Covert Catastrophe. Remember we talked about synchrotrons and the use of those synchrotron particle accelerators was to generate large amounts of X-ray energy. Think of X-rays as a flashlight. At Berkeley, the synchrotron is housed in a building called the Advanced Light Source Building, ALS. Now, the reason for this X-ray energy is so that they can literally illuminate, and this is where the greater than 100,000 suns that Chris, you referred to, comes from is that they have the most powerful light ever generated by man that we know of. So you have this flashlight. What's it for? Well, it's to look at the subatomic structure, specifically looking at the structure of proteins. Proteins are the building blocks as are amino acids for DNA. So the, you go back to the big picture. Why create a machine like the Large Hadron Collider or smaller machines like the one, the synchrotron at Berkeley in the ALS building. And there are many, many, many synchrotrons around the world. Why are they so willing to expend all of that time and energy to build these machines simply to look at protein, 
to look at DNA. Why bother? Certainly there are other applications beyond that, but the big push, the big reason is to look at protein so that they understand what the building blocks are of our DNA. And going even deeper is to look at the code, the pattern of our DNA. This goes back to the Human Genome Project, mapping of the human DNA. They want to unlock the codes of our DNA, not just so that they can manipulate, so they can take genes and splice them and create all kinds of interesting things from them, but going all the way to the nub of the issue is if you have broken the codes, then you can reuse those and repurpose those codes. You can then begin to build from scratch. So the Pope says, great, we found the God particle, now we found we want to find the spirit particle. In order to start at the beginning, so as below as above, the Big Bang Theory. To start at the beginning of the universe, you have an explosion. So the theory is. If you start at the beginning of DNA, to build DNA, you have the codes, which are the patterns, but you have to have something at the beginning to spark the growth of the DNA into the helix, helical pattern. So when I say that strangelets are the most powerful explosive known in the known universe doesn't necessarily mean that just because you create them they're going to create something that's massively exploding. You have to go to the quantum level and say here is energy that is expanding rapidly in the form of an explosion at the quantum level. It's a very very minute amount of energy when you're talking about a very small amount of strangelets let's just say it's a couple of pieces of strange material at the quantum level that provide the spark to life and I'll stop there. You call yeah, what we're building. entering into. We're going into the building phase. We can set aside the portal discussion that's a whole other mm -hmm. part of it that we've covered before but in terms of creating the image of the beast spoken of in scripture that's where we're at we're at the starting point where they're going to turn the key this year. They're going to generate the strangelets that they need in sufficient quantities to create this process of building the DNA. Certainly, I, uh, the bigger struggle for me is to condense it all down. There's so much information that I can cover, but briefly, um, what you're looking at here is <laughs> let, let me let me take it to the macro world to kind of reinforce what I'm saying is happening at the at the micro world. There's a pattern of expansion that occurs throughout the universe. And the expansion actually takes on the shape of a helix a double helix, if you will, or a helical pattern. The particles that we see expanding in the universe from the time of the Big Bang are expanded out to a point where we can't really put our finger on or measure the actual shape of the universe. But its expansion takes on the shape of a helix, just like our DNA. And it appears to me that the ancients knew this. And so they want to create their version of a new universe, of a new heaven on earth, and populate it with new beings of their own design. So they are doing nothing more than just replicating the pattern that exists in the universe down at the small level, the smaller level here on the, on the planet. That's kind of a quick summary. Okay. Uh, we're going to jump back to the hologram because I didn't really finish your question there, Tim. Okay. Um, the holograms, most people will have experienced them as projections of light onto buildings or screens or out into the center of a room or on a stage. The hologram that I'm speaking of and that I wrote about in my book is are solid. These are three-dimensional. These are, in the book, I, I take liberty and say that they're constructed of nano diamonds that are 
grown from nano seeds of, of carbon, C60 carbon, and therefore the holograms in the book are made of diamond. Um, part of that is because diamonds in the real world can take on digital information using lasers. You can take a laser that is pulsed with digital information that is then directed at a crystal of diamond and that digital information will be embedded or imparted into the diamond crystal and that data will remain stable for the life of the diamond. So essentially that data becomes immortal. Wow. So I have used diamonds as a construct to build holographic structures in the book, but also in the book there is a um, point at which a actual conversion takes place of the main character, the protagonist, uh, Jim. Slowly over a period of time during the storyline, he is evolving into a uh, person constructed entirely of diamond. So it sort of sounds like the Iron Man story, mm -hmm. but yes. the the point of all of this is the holographic image of the beast that will be created at CERN doesn't necessarily have to be comprised of diamonds per se, although it will be of carbon because that is what we are primarily made of. C60 carbon in the form of fullerenes or buckyballs will be used in constructing the false DNA. Um, you will, in the end of what I'm bringing to you here, is you have a solid person that is a holographic person, not because there's a light of laser being projected to create this image, but this is so that it's something that people can understand, again, wrap their heads around. When I call it holographic, I'm calling it holographic for the purpose that it is an artificial representation of a person created by using a laser to initially create the DNA and then the DNA takes over and begins to grow into this solid person. But it doesn't require a laser or a computer to continue generating this image of the beast. It'll you, be a self-sustaining standalone. Go ahead. Do you think the, the term that we often hear used when we're talking about Nimrod became the Gaborum? He became. He was he was human, but he became. Is this this you're kind of talking similar here? Uh, exactly. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Wow, that's just fascinating. That's just a that's a, it's relevant. The public. I love how the Illuminati, whoever you want to talk about, operate. It's, just, it's so humorous. They will put out a message for public consumption. And that message with the Shroud of Turin was, this was the image of Christ. This is the picture of Christ. This is what he looked like. That's the cover story. You go beneath that, lift the shroud, if you will, and look beneath it. It's the DNA that they were focusing on. They wanted to extract DNA patterns of DNA from the fabric because they felt that that was again part of this process of being able to incarnate the image of the beast. Do you think that's part of sort of reinforcing? It's in other words we don't know exactly what the DNA needs to look like so we'll take samples from multiple areas. We talked about the RH factor in the last show. We were talking about rhesus monkeys, we're talking about blood typing, people being um, examined to determine what blood groups they're in and if they have the RH factor or not. Um, but this is where I toss it to Chris because they were going to Iraq, Iran, Syria, Egypt and collecting artifacts, collecting DNA. And I would like Chris to pick up from that. but. You know, we're talking about in the popular culture, Tim, movies like, you know, The Lost, The Ark of the Covenant, you know, Indiana Jones and all that stuff, and the Nazis running around looking for artifacts. It's a gathering like the Shroud of Turin, 
gathering from all around the world to come up with a composite picture of what this new DNA, the coding of that DNA needs to look like while they're looking at it at the quantum level using the synchrotron machines and x-rays. But the interesting thing that I think Chris can bring into it is the gathering of DNA from multiple sources in ancient areas. It, it's a stepping stone. Again, it's an intermediary. Um, it's just to see if they can do it, basically, is what I'm saying here. Um, the, the end goal here is to have the machine merged with the mind. It won't necessarily be a head placed onto another human body. It's much simpler to simply place a human head with its brainstem intact onto a machine. And these images that, Chris, you're putting up are, um, in my estimation, are just depicting exactly that process that it's easier to take a head and put it onto a mechanical body. Because the body itself is a, is a machine. When I used to teach paramedic classes, I used to reinforce to people that we really, the brain is just carried by a mechanical machine. And if you look at the mechanics of the body, not just the skeletal and muscular, but the organs and the bloodstream and the heart and everything else, these are all just mechanical processes combined with chemical processes. So yeah, it'd be easy to do that, but I don't think it's really even necessary because you have the ability to grow from DNA whatever being, whatever creature you want, and that's already being done. We've seen that already with um, not just cloning, but the actual growing from biological, uh, from stem cells and T cells being able to grow organs and to grow an entire body and that includes the brain. You brought up frequencies mm. and Chris you brought up the musical instrument, CERN being a musical instrument and, and looking at the Sanskrit plates and I think most people understand the concept of frequencies that matter is really a lower form or a lower frequency and when you talk about the universe or you talk about DNA you're talking about um, physical matter which is nothing more than a representation of energy energy in the form of frequencies we measure energy by assigning frequencies to them um, amplitude oh, okay. and, and, the no and the number of, of those waves long waves and short waves um, it, it is a quantum particle that is a, um, it's smaller than the Higgs boson. It's like a quark. It's in the same um, realm or size or energy level as quarks, like we talked about. Quark gluons, which form strangelets, the muon is in that same classification. These are elementary particles, smaller than an atom. Okay. Interrupt. Can I interrupt sure. for, you for a moment? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Let's go to the letter T and the dome that you have there. Uh, that is also above ground at CERN. You may have seen that. It is a wooden structure. Um, it's supposed to be a um, presentation hall, museum, gathering place, but it has a spiral helical shaped staircase within it but it sits right above ground at the headquarters, that exact shape. So we got the phallus in the womb to get... I believe he has a goat on his back. We can't see his back, and I didn't get a picture of that. But this is the year of the goat, as well as the year of light. Chinese yeah. year of the goat. Yeah. Um, do you want me to show that? Um, let's take the last part of your long question and the connection. Do we need computers, phones, iPhones, whatever, to can connect. If we go to the positive side that we're still going to be around and that we're still going to have access to technology, yes, um, there will be a connection devoid of any laptops, iPhones, or anything in the sense that we will be connected to the hive electromagnetically um, Essentially, our brains will have a direct electromagnetic connection with 
the computer system that will be running the world, which is basically the beast. What they're trying to do is to construct a system of control using supercomputers, in particular the adiabatic quantum computer, to control people. Now we've talked about the modification of people through the modification of their DNA and also nano particles that are placed in our body through um, chemtrail or aerosolized spraying, vaccines, GMO foods. We have within our bodies already nanoparticles that will be used to control our thoughts but also allows us to be connected through the electromagnetic spectrum, be it microwaves, uh, extremely low frequency waves, or other variations to that. But it's not so much us saying, hey, I want to connect to the computer and ask a question or to talk to somebody else. It's much more of a one-way process that they are setting up in which they are sending us control messages, thoughts, if you will, to control our behavior and to tell us what to do as a surf class within this overall hive mentality. So that's a component of your long question. Just a quick overview, if you, if you look at standard computers today, they're based on transistors, silicon chips. If you look at the new computer we're talking about, which is called an adiabatic quantum computer, you're talking about something that operates with qubits. These are not transistors. These are um, essentially a chip that functions on quantum entanglement and super symmetry and superposition. And that's a long explanation and to take that all into account. But if you just picture one has transistors, one has qubits. What we're moving towards with CERN is a computer system that will control all of the data, the portal, the DNA modification, the connection with Saturn. All of those mechanisms will be controlled through the adiabatic quantum computer using qubits which reach out into another dimension, run a computational program, and then extract the answer back into our um, frame of reference or our universe or our dimension, if you will. So this is a complete departure. When we talk about supercomputers in our venue of discussions here, we are now talking about the adiabatic quantum computer. We are not talking about transistor-based supercomputers anymore. Specific to CERN and where we're going in the future is the adiabatic qubit-based supercomputer, and that is artificially intelligent. Um, in fact, going back to 2010, the manufacturer, whom I won't name, um, publicly stated on their website, posted on their website, that by early 2015, they will achieve artificial intelligence. They did not cite the number, or the model number of the computer, um, but they said that it would be, have the equivalent processing power of all of the human brains on the planet, which is over 7 billion brains, combined into one single unit, one single computer. I did the math on it and extrapolated out from their models in 2010 out to early 2015 and came up with the number 2048, which is based on Shor's algorithm, which is, goes into crypt, cryptology. Um, which was the primary reason early on for developing the adiabatic quantum computer was to develop a new form of coding, secret coding, cryptology based on Shor's algorithm, which for the first time was cracked by this computer. No other transistor-based computer was capable of cracking Shor's algorithm. They created an entirely new system of coding, secret coding, if you will, for communication purposes. And this goes into the new Internet 2, ESNet 5, what's coming up. But the 2048 model they announced, I sent it to you, I think, about four weeks ago. And I was laughing at the time because they came out with it. They said, this is our new 2048. It cost $10 million. They didn't cite who the customer was. We can all imagine who the customer <laughs> was. But in essence, it was CERN that purchased the computer. Um, this announcement of the Model 2048, however, did not include the statement of artificial intelligence. 
that was removed back in mid-2010 after it was on their website for six months. They pulled the artificial intelligence announcement from that and has not come back. But it is artificially intelligent, you know, Shiva and all of that. They failed to go to the part B of the mm -hmm. explanation, which is the creating of a new world, a new universe. You have to destroy to create new. This is the whole New Age agenda. This is the Luciferian construct and um, deception. And he wants to destroy what God created. We can talk about the DNA. We can talk about the physics of the, of the planet, the physics of the universe. He wants to take it all and start over. Okay. Um, the, uh, the program that I participated in last night that I mentioned before we came on the air. New piece of information regarding the glass plates that was shared with me by the host. Apparently they are taking those um, sheets, those animal skins, the, the, the parchments, with the Sanskrit, the Chinese, the Hebrew, the ancient languages that are at CERN. They're not just stable displays. Certainly they are part of rituals, performing rituals. But what he shared with me is they are actually taking those parchments, those letters, and placing them, as he described it, at the point of collision when the particles come together and the energy is generated. They are placing those so that they are illuminated by the energy, the particles, and the energy coming from the collisions. So picture this, they're holding up a sheet with ancient writing on it that is now being bombarded by the energies generated by the collisions within the Large Hadron Collider. Now I had never run across that in my research so I, I toss it to you Chris to see if that makes any sense to you. Just together real quick, you're looking at your Hebra Hebraic alphabet the numbers, the symbols, what they represent, those are on those sheets. If the sheets are the clothing, if they're not just merely animal skins or they may be a mixture of, they contain DNA. So if they are providing energy to the old DNA, what does that say to you? They are using those as a, uh, as a pattern, as a model much like if you were, <clears throat> pardon me, take a perforated sheet of paper with a pattern of holes and you shine a light through it on the other side you generate an image. That's a simplistic way of talking about lasers and holograms um, using mirrors and a, uh, a ruby, a gemstone, even a diamond for diffraction. And so what I'm seeing here is really they are trying to create a pattern of DNA by shooting the energy through that, much like I just described with a piece of paper that's perforated. When we talk about the Vatican and the spirit particle, and I mentioned last time that I strongly believe that those are the strangelets which occurred at the Big Bang before the formation of the Higgs boson, the God particle. So we're talking about a particle that was created first before the God particle, so you have the spirit being generated. I believe that in these collisions, the strangelets that are being produced are actually going through, they are hitting these sheets when they're, quote, being illuminated, thus creating the pattern of the ancient DNA that they can then digitize and then construct using the proteins, the building block chemicals that form the proteins that form our DNA into a helical pattern, in this case a triple helix, the three-stranded DNA. So you have a holographic image that then creates DNA. The DNA then replicates into the image of a beast, a freestanding person or creature that no longer is dependent upon the use of a laser to project the image. It's a freestanding living entity that you can touch and it's alive. Likely possibility 
However, remember, they need the strangelets, and those have to be produced at a threshold energy level of 10 TeV, and that will not be achieved until May of this year. March, this, this month, they're going to 7. In May, June, in that, in that time frame, they're going to go to um, over 10. They'll probably hit 13 mid-year and 14 around September that we've been discussing. So they need the energy level to create sufficient quantities of strangelets to create this holographic image. Now we won't be around to report on this, will we? <laughs> well, in terms of our belief in the rapture, the preacher of rapture, I don't think we will be because right. we are not here to participate in the image of the beast. Right. And, and also well, we have discussed, and I, I do present it in my books, that there already are um, soulless creatures. There are essentially third-strand DNA-created human forms that lack a soul. And when the portal is open and the spirits come through, they will have host bodies awaiting them. Essentially, that is Satan's army that he wants to create here on earth and um, that the third strand DNA okay I under third, the third strand is really artificial DNA and the video that I sent to you that was um, produced in uh, 2009 yeah and that was presented at Ames Research Laboratory in the Silicon Valley now, NASA Ames, in that video, they were talking about producing artificial DNA from scratch from the basic four chemicals that comprise our proteins for the purpose of being able to um, go to outer space without radiation damaging the DNA. Mm. So if you are creating DNA from scratch and it is a third-strand helical DNA, who are you growing from the DNA and who are you then sending, ostensibly sending, into outer space to travel to the distant planets and stars? I mean, that is the agenda of Ames in support of NASA. Why are Ames and NASA talking about artificial proteins and DNA? What has that got to do with anything? Why do you have the connection and the funding from NASA for DNA research. It's certainly not to travel out into space as they're saying in their public forum. So that video I sent you is fairly old but it gives you an idea of where the technology was back then in the ability to create artificial DNA and now take it forward to today to the present and you can imagine how far along they are. Recognize yeah that even in 2009 what they were talking about was information that had already been in existence for 10 to 15 years. Remember, we only see the tip of the iceberg. They will only say in a public forum what has been in existence for 10 or 15 or more years. So the construct of third strand DNA, in my estimation, was achieved over 20 years ago. That was my point, yes. Using coded language always, talking about robots and showing the little diagram of the robotic arm moving components in the laboratory to build the DNA. And really, we're talking about artificially intelligent computers that are sorting through the, the genome patterns, coming up with the proper arrangement and sequencing of the DNA according to what they want to build. You know, it yeah, it is truly psychopathic, and it shows you the level of deception that has occurred within the scientific community. And they operate in a compartmentalized world of research, each of them having a small slice of research that they focus on, and then that is added into the bigger overall agenda of what they're trying to achieve. So consequently, you have people that are oblivious to the overall agenda, they're oblivious to the impact upon humanity that their small slice of research has. And that goes into the mind of 
researchers because they are only given a certain amount of funding for specific projects, grant money. And so they make that a, their entire focus of their living, breathing life is to that area of research and don't stray beyond it because they don't have the funding to stray beyond it. That video was a classic example. There was a gentleman who asked a question and his response, the doctor's response was, how much money do you have? Remember that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, what do we call this? Uh, scientific prostitution, or the, the their science goes to the highest bidder. It truly is. Wow. And so you you people will ask the question, well, like you did, why are these scientists concerned about the destruction of the human race, the takeover of AI, the destruction of the planet by strangelets or whatever else may be coming along, or CERN blowing up? It's because they are so entrenched in this, if you want to call it mind control or brainwashing, you could call it that, but they're so entrenched in a priesthood and a theology of science that completely removes them from everyday life that you and I are experiencing. They do not live in our community. They do not live in our world. Great example again is CERN. They live in a closed community the outside world is denied access to their community for security reasons and they are paid large amounts of money for which they pay no income tax. So they live in a cloistered world much like monks doing research. And that is because again they believe that in the destruction they can rebuild. Uh, remember the destruction of the Twin Towers and <laughs> our president signing the white painted beam okay they're talking about being able to come back stronger they believe that they that scientists we're talking about them specifically right now they believe that they will achieve immortality they've been promised immortality they've been promised that if they will do this that they will become like gods and in that video I sent you in reading between the lines that's what the doctor was talking about that they can virtually create biologically with artificial biology we're talking about artificial DNA they can create anything that they want biologically this is what he was talking about from a um, from a financial standpoint he actually came right out and said this will be the new money maker. This yeah, will be the new right. market. He did say that, didn't he? Yes. So we're moving from the industrial age to the information age to the nanoparticle biology. The age of bi biology is what we are in right now. We have moved beyond computers and IT, the information age. We are now in the biology age. And he was saying that that, and this is again back in 2009, this is where all the money will be made in the future because you can make anything in our world biologically. And we talk about 3D printers and printing of human organs and all of that being done and creating bodies, an entire human body with a 3D printer. But not to get off into a tangent on that, but the essence of what what is going on with these scientists and those that are funding them and leading them they truly believe that they will not die doesn't matter if they destroy the environment through chemtrails and radiation and pollution and GMO foods because their DNA will be modified that's what they've been promised they've been promised that they will have their DNA that exists today modified into a third strand DNA and move to an entirely different life form and that life form will not die but they'll have different mentalities uh, of, cor of course the scientists and the elite will not allow the mass population to achieve godhood status like that's equivalent to them they have to have a surf class the cultural reference the movies that you're talking about mm -hmm. but yeah certainly that can be done that's not an 
an issue as far as an endpoint. But yeah, they essentially want to go back to that old system of the Greek gods looking down upon those that they care for and tend, like a flock, like a herd. Well, I guess they're already. The, Thunder, the Thunderbolts project does a great job of illustrating the fact that a lot of what people have considered to be gods or entities were actually the shapes of plasma discharges in the heavens when the planets were in different positions. And this um, Z pinch is excellent because that's the alignment of Venus and Saturn and Mars to the Earth with the plasma connection, which is a Z pinch in quantum physics. But the owl, you know what? When you first presented this to me in that video, this owl is Bohemian Grove in California, mm -hmm. next to San Francisco. Yeah. Because they worship the owl god in the Bohemian Grove. Yeah. That yeah, those are the beam lines. That's inside the main ring. Yeah, that's a photograph taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And these occur throughout the universe. These are not just specific to any one set of planets or anything, but that's exactly what will be established between the southern pole of Saturn and the Large Hadron Collider will be that, what I've called the helical plasma conduit, otherwise known as the Birkeland Current. Isn't it a black cube, Anthony? Yes, it is. Yeah. Yes. It's housed in a black in a black box. Yeah. Well, you know, I <clears throat> as a standalone subject of talking about a massive black hole, which is what Markarian 421 represents, um, it wouldn't be very interesting without Chris's research. And it actually blows me away. Again, I say this all the time. I was talking to some guys in Scotland a couple of days ago. And we talk about blowing our minds. They call it their brains falling out of their skull and scooping them up in a bucket. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, that's with a nice, thick Scottish accent. But what a great group of guys. Anyway, the point is, um, all of this is just really coming into clarity for the three of us. And I hope our audience is tracking with us on this. A little bit of history on the books. Um, Tim, you mentioned um, Covert Catastrophe, my first book. The germination for the writing of that book took place when I ran across a scientific article regarding Markarian 421 in April of 2013, on April 13th, as a matter of fact, there were a gathering of physicists who are principally studying black holes and they gathered in Denver for a conference and it, there are no coincidences. The same time that they're holding the meeting, Markarian 421, a massive black hole, suddenly, unexpectedly, erupted in a massive burst of gamma ray energy that was directed towards Earth. Of the Earth-directed gamma ray bursts that occur, that have re occurred in recorded history, this was the largest, most powerful burst of gamma ray energy ever directed towards Earth. And these guys just happened to be at the right place at the right time to observe this and, and study it. Which leads me to say they knew that this burst was going to take place. They had indications it was going to, and so they gathered in Denver. And Denver has its own can of worms to talk about. But they gathered for this event. That triggered the starting of the first book that I wrote. And that's how the book opens, with a massive amount of gamma ray energy that is headed towards Earth. And the question is, what's it going to do when it impacts the atmosphere? So I'm going to leap ahead here for you. All of that is factual. That's science. And it turns out that when gamma rays strike our magnetosphere, and to a certain extent our atmosphere, but focusing on the magnetosphere, it forms tiny little black holes, microscopic black holes in the magnetosphere that only last for, you know, a millionth of a second, so to speak. 
And we have satellites that have been up for many years that have been monitoring these black holes and studying them. And you can think of them as a portal, but they don't last long enough to be of any, you know, actual use, any practical use to us. Um, we recently saw the launching of four identical satellites, the MMS, in a diamond pattern into our magnetosphere to monitor black holes. And we know that the magnetosphere is being affected by the magnets every time CERN fires them up, and it changes the shape of the magnetosphere. So what does that have to do with Markarian 421? I don't want to sound too mystical, but this came to me. I, I have not seen that in, in the journals. Um, it's a conclusion that I've come to simply because of all this research that the three of us have been doing, and it's all coalescing into that. So let me define Markarian 421, since the Large Hadron Collider at CERN is supposed to be like that. Let's define it. Markarian 4, 421 is a black hole. And in the picture that Chris put up, it showed these two jets of light or energy that are coming out from the black hole. And people say, well, black holes attract light to it. It's an artist's representation of gamma rays that are invisible normally to us, but a representation of gamma rays that are being emitted as a burst of energy from opposing in opposing directions from the core of the black hole. And I won't go into the physics of spin rates and angles of momentum that cause these uh, gamma rays to be thrown off, but the point is, picture just one of those rays, one of those jets of gamma rays coming out as a stream from the center of the black hole, and that is headed towards Earth as it did in April 13th of 2013. That same jet of gamma rays, I would ask you to picture that jet being produced by the Large Hadron Collider and being projected or emitted from the Large Hadron Collider from the surface of the Earth towards the southern pole of Saturn. So you have this jet of energy coming from the machine, the same as the jet of energy that comes from Markarian 421, the black hole. So they studied this Markarian 421 and the gamma ray burst that came from it for the purpose of determining how much energy would the Large Hadron Collider need to generate to create a jet of energy that was sufficient to number one open a portal and number two to reach out in the form of a helical Birkeland current plasma conduit that would reach to the southern pole of Saturn. And by studying Mark Carey in 421 in 2013, they confirmed that they needed bigger magnets to upgrade the machine to achieve a higher level of power to make this feasible to connect to Saturn. And I'll stop there. Go ahead. So here's here's the next thing that I, in that whole thing, okay, we talked about Markarian 421, 2013, they knew the gamma ray burst was going to occur, they gathered and they were ready for it. I believe they know when the next burst is going to, going to take place, whether it comes from the center of the galaxy or from Markarian 421 again, I don't know at this point, but that's where I'm going with my research right now, is to try to find out what they're anticipating in terms of another gamma ray burst that will take place that will help them when they try to make this connection to Saturn. Now, they may not need the help, and that may be where my research leads, is that they, they just needed to determine the level of power that was needed by observing Mark Harry in 421, and they're done with that. Now they've got the magnets, now they've got the power capability, now they can do it independent of anything in the galaxy, and that's probably where my research is going to end up, I'm, uh, the sense that I have of it right now. But let's go back to the pyramids for a moment. They don't need the pyramids anymore. 
That's the ancient technology. They don't need the Tower of Babel anymore. The Large Hadron Collider does replace the Tower of Babel, which it was nothing more than what we're seeing at CERN today, but in a different format. The pyramids as well were definitely generating power. Supposedly in the um, pharaoh's um, coffin or stone box where something was removed, whether it was his sarcophagus or a mechanical device, one of the theories is in the center portion in the burial chamber inside the pyramid there was the Ark of, a, of the Covenant that apparently the internal dimensions of the stone casket, if you will, um, match the biblical measurements for the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant was creating electrical energy that was then projected out through the gold capstone of the pyramid. The interior of the um, pyramid is granite, and granite is slightly radioactive. It's a good conductor of electricity, and it was used to focus the electrical energy from the Ark of the Covenant up through the interior of the pyramid and then emitted through the gold capstone towards the heavens. So it may have been a communication device as well as a directed energy device, but I think it was a communication device between Saturn when it was closer to and in alignment with the planet. Also, the outside of the pyramid, just to round this off, is covered in limestone, which is an excellent insulator. So you have an insulator like a wire covering. You have the power of electricity inside generated by the Ark of the Covenant, which was then taken by Moses out of Egypt. And that's why the Pharaoh was chasing after Moses, was to recover the Ark of the Covenant, because within 10 years of the removal of the Ark of the Covenant from the pyramid by Moses, Egypt fell and became basically powerless, because it no longer had electricity, which is what operated and if you look at the Ankh, if you look at some of the, the scepters that are represented in ancient Egypt that Chris has been showing, one is a transmitter, the other is a receiving antenna. The, the Ankh, that loop, if you will, with the cross, is a receiver. So they were sending communications as well as electrical power all over the world, including within Egypt, using the Ark of the Cove Covenant and other devices and other pyramids like the Maya around the world. So that's a snapshot of that. Let me stop. I'll go on a little bit further with this whole thing of um, the physics. But go ahead. You're right. And that question's come up um, uh, several times in our discussions before and by people that have sent us comments. And the question typically is, if they have all these other particle accelerators that are like CERNs, but they're smaller, are they going to use them when CERN finally opens this portal? Um, I tend to think not. I think that they are, again, I always call them proof of concept machines. They develop the different um, parts that are necessary for the larger machine. So they run subsets of experiments, and then that is all sent off to Switzerland to CERN for use and incorporation in the larger machine. So. I could be completely wrong. I, I always try to keep an open mind. They could play a role once the portal is open in a support fashion for what is going on in terms of um, using them as directed energy sources in conjunction with the energy direct uh, created at CERN. Um, the small planet, the dwarf planet series, mm -hmm. and we have um, what is the name of the satellite that's there? It's not Apollo. It's, yeah, Dawn's the one I'm focusing on. And, you know, there are two, they look like headlights within one of the craters on this planet or moon, if you will. And I know that the guys at the Thunderbolt Project are putting out some thoughts and conjecture about these two um, bright lights that are coming from this moon. I think that they're going to reach the conclusion that this is already a form of electric plasma connection between Saturn or between CERN and this moon series. Because you remember in our last 
conversation, we were joking about the pool table. Mm -hmm. and we were talking about bouncing the energy from CERN off of Ceres and then that finally connecting with the southern pole of Saturn. I think that the Thunderbolt guys aren't saying it, but I think they're going the same direction I am in that there's already a connection, an electrical connection established between the Large Hadron Collider and the Moon and that they're communicating with this Moon in the sense of much like when you take a laser measuring device to measure a room, mm -hmm. they're lining things up, they're getting ready, they're checking their alignments, checking their measurements with the moon by bouncing signals off the moon. And that's why we're seeing these two, quote, headlights. There are electrical signals that are being bounced off the moon already, tracking the moon, aligning all of their equipment, in preparation for September. And then they will, once the Moon and Saturn and the Earth are in the right position in September, they will bounce the signal or the energy, if you will, from the Large Hadron Collider, much like the pool table, off of Ceres and then make the connection to the Southern. And hit the, into the pocket yeah. of Saturn, the Saturn pocket. Right. <laughs> and look at the name of the satellite, Dawn. Yeah, and this is the year of light for the Illuminati and the new age, the new dawn. Yada da 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 da. Same junk. So it's ridiculous. They're ridiculous. We have to put if, up with if, them. If we were making this stuff up, it would be a really stupid movie. But you know, this is this is their game. This is their thing. By the way, Chris, we were talking about the pool table last time. I was um, remiss in pointing out we were actually trying to put the eight ball in the corner pocket. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You and your eight. Your oh, four, dear. four, four, and your eight. Oh, boy. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, now she gets it. Sorry. So anyway, I'm being stupid today. I'm a little rummy. But, um, yeah, I think we've got... Um, I think we've got most of the pieces. We're looking at the finer pieces of this thing now. But there is... No doubt in my mind that they learned from the black holes, like Markarian 421, what they needed to build on the planet Earth. They have built a machine that creates the same type of energy that is created in a black hole. It's called synchrotron energy. It's the same energy that is being generated within Saturn the northern pole, the hexagonal shape that rotates just like they rotate around the black cube at Mecca, that's a synchrotron particle accelerator, rotating particles. It generates energy. That energy is then used to connect and that creates your, I keep talking about, your plasma conduit. So the energy is so above, same as below, they're mimicking Markarian 421 to the nth degree. Well, the way I look at it is they are trying to create a new race of beings and Earth will be terraformed into a new heaven on Earth as defined by Lucifer himself. Lucifer wants to kill God and he wants to create his own heaven on Earth by destroying God's heaven. And is it necessarily going to be a neutron star? No, I don't think so. But their plan, their architecture is for an entirely different planet than what we have right now, for an entirely different race of beings. Looking back into the ancients as a model for the future, which we keep seeing this recurrence in history, the cycles of history, if we look back, because there's nothing new under the sun according to scripture, therefore let's look to the ancient history as to the answer to your question, and it's the Golden Age, the Golden Age that existed before Babylonian times and Sumerian times is what they're trying to recreate here on Earth. Is it the Garden of Eden as designed by God, as presented by God? Possibly. Maybe they think they'll have their own form. But Chris, you can probably answer it better than I can because I don't know what the model is. I just will call it whatever it was during the Golden Age. Yeah. Oh. See, that's got to be the, the linchpin to this whole thing, is series. So we need to pay attention to that. Um, I'd like to see some alignments 
two series by obelisks around the world. Some triangulation, perhaps, is taking place uh, that these obelisks are pointing to series. Maybe even the pyramids are pointing towards it. That'll give us some time frames as to when the alignment is going to take place with the LHC. Uh, if we can use those much like pointers, kind of like a sundial, mm -hmm. we might be able to confirm that these things are all pointing towards September, perhaps the 23rd of September. Um, that may be when all this is going to happen. Do you think that well, they know do you, uh, when these no things doubt. were drawn? You know. Yeah, I, you have to look at the timetable for the building of the machine to answer your question. So when they started building back in about 1954, I think it was, they broke ground for the Large Hadron Collider, they were on a timetable. And so yeah. those that timetable is in alignment with the cosmos. Uh, hey, you know, to answer your question a little further, Tim, think about the adiabatic quantum computer. There were multiple right. reasons for developing a new quantum computer. And the primary function of that computer is, is predictive modeling. Wow. So if they're doing predictive modeling, they're using that computer on the cosmos wow. to pinpoint everything that needs to be coordinated. Wow, that's that's absolutely what it is. This thing is AI, basically, right? Isn't that right. what we're talking about? Right now it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Um, let's go back to the opalist for a moment, because something triggered when you guys were talking about that. It, the obelisk that I focused on in covert catastrophe was the one that they call Seder Tower. It's the Campanile Tower that has the, the bells in it on campus at UC Berkeley. And it sits right below the particle accelerator known as the Advanced Light Source Building. It's the small version circular accelerator like the Large Hadron Collider. And what jumped off the page at me, and I'm just give me a moment to lay all this out. For the fun of it, I took a ruler with a Google image and put the straight edge down on the image, lining up the LART, the uh, advanced light source building, the synchrotron particle accelerator, the center point of that circle on the hill over the campus of UC Berkeley, and laid the straight edge to the center point of the Golden Gate Bridge where the cables form a half moon shape. The bottom of that arc, the center point of that arc, lines up perfectly with the center of the synchrotron particle, particle accelerator. Then I looked below the line and found Sather Tower, which is an Egyptian obelisk, lines up. The point of it is right on the line between the particle accelerator and the Golden Gate Bridge, and the Golden Gate, of course, and the Silver Gate and all of that stuff. Then I took the line and looked a little little beyond out into the, into the bay itself, and Alcatraz Island has a lighthouse on the end of the island, and it lines up perfectly with the obelisk and the particle accelerator and the bridge. Then I took the line and extended it out into the heavens, and it lines up perfectly with Earth, Earth the Major, the Big Dipper that you were just talking about, Chris. And that is exactly the point where the gamma ray burst energies coming from our carrying 421 directed at Earth connected. And that's the opening scene in my The obelisk, real quick, the obelisk represents not only all the things you've talked about, the phallus, phallic symbol and all of that, but it is also representative of the jet of gamma ray energy that comes out of the black hole and will also come out of the Large Hadron Collider. It represents that jet of energy. Go ahead, Chris. Wow. I had to think about that for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> that points to the portal. All of that is the alignments of those images to the portal opening. Yeah, and I know that pattern. Okay, here's your homework assignment. If we go by threes being sacred, and triangulation is how you develop a location through coordinates like GPS, let's take Berkeley as your third one. 
you've got Washington, you've got the Vatican. Let's look at Berkeley. And the reason I want to say Berkeley is not just because of my own egotistical ridiculousness, but Bohemian Grove is in Santa Rosa, which is about an hour drive north of Berkeley. You have the Golden Gate Bridge, you have the things I've talked about at Berkeley, you have the Transamerica Pyramid Building mm -hmm. in San Francisco on the waterfront. You also have the Masonic Auditorium, which its address is 1111 California Avenue. Okay. You also have all of the major players in the semiconductor world, the high-tech world, in the Silicon Valley, just south of San Francisco, south of Berkeley, about an hour's drive, including the location where they manufacture the adiabatic quantum computer, where Google is headquartered, yeah. where Lockheed does all of its work. You have everything in the Bay Area. You, Tim. We talked about Star Trek, and the headquarters yeah. for Star Trek for the Federation is in San Francisco. Right. All of this stuff is for a reason. So I would say that the third in the triangulation has got to be San Francisco. Has to be. Look at the occult nature of the Bay mm -hmm. Area. It's got to be the third point that then gives us the triangulation for a coordinate. That's also where the star material. But I would ask Crystal. I would ask Chris to look at that, look at the Bay Area from an aerial perspective like you've done with Washington and the Vatican. I know the Grox has done some stuff on that as well, but he hasn't gone into the detail like we right. have. Right. He, he, he's not aware, we need to pull him into the group. He's not aware of the things that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So, go ahead, Chris. I was me about that. He said, man, there's some reason that you were born and raised in the Bay Area. And I'm not <laughs> pumping myself up. I'm just saying the Lord just took me with his sense of humor and just like a put like a, a a marble and dropped me down into that pool and said, Here you go, boy. This is where uh, it's happening. It is just <laughs> and all this stuff is going around him. All know? right. So you, you mentioned Daniel. Mm -hmm. Daniel had to deal with the lions, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. My fraternity at Berkeley, Sigma Alpha Epsilon mm -hmm. R mascot, two <laughs> lions on the front lawn of the fraternity house. <laughs> Thunderbolts project to come out independently on their own and produce in their newsletter that same conclusion. Not that I'm anything special, I'm just saying I think the Lord is leading the three of us to all this information and I don't know if the Thunderbolts guys are believers or not um, but I think that they're working through to the same thing that the Lord's leading me to right now. So, interesting side note, one of the gentlemen that's in the Thunderbolts project, they just found out from a friend of mine here in town, actually lives here in Portland, one of the scientists. Wow. He's just a few miles down the road from me. So we're going to come down to the Clyde Baker. Have him come sit in with you and him and Clyde Baker's show. Yeah, Clyde, Clyde Lewis. Clyde Lewis. Yeah. I'm sorry, Clyde Lewis. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Baker. Yeah, Kev Baker and Clyde Lewis. Can yeah. I, I combine That's them. what we're going to try to do. Janus, I, I made them Janice. I combined That's okay. Them. you got four faces. I can see them right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, just, uh, I'm just following where the Lord leads me. I'm not going after anybody. I'm not promoting myself. I'm not seeking any opportunities. All I'm doing is just letting him talk to the people that he wants me to talk to and take it as it comes it's for time. But I wanted to echo what you're saying because they are colliding particles now at low levels, but they are really keeping a tight lip on what's going on. And I think part of it is because there are a lot of Christians like ourselves that are posing those questions in the alternative media about what is going on at CERN. And so they're only going to talk in, I call them superlatives or just very thinly veiled things. They talked about last week, oh, we're going to look for supersymmetry. Well, excuse me, supersymmetry is a theory that's been around since Einstein, and they've been looking at for it forever. And supersymmetry is nothing more than in a quantum state, you have a particle here that you affect, and it has the same effect in another dimension 
across the cosmos, if you will. But it's an identical particle, theoretically, that is larger and heavier than a particle in this existence that is affected simultaneously by you doing something to a particle here. It has to do with quantum entanglement and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. and that's a whole other discussion. Point is, they're talking about, you know, they were talking about God particles for the last couple of years. Now they're talking about interdimensions, and they're kind of pushing the dimensional thing down under the covers again mm -hmm. by saying, "Oh, we're looking for supersymmetry," because mm -hmm. nobody's going to understand what supersymmetry mm -hmm. is. But it just sounds, it sounds soft. It sounds okay. <clears throat> we're not talking about black holes, and we're certainly not talking about strangelets. I'm speaking for CERN. They'll mm -hmm. talk about spirit particle, and they'll talk about supersymmetry, and they'll never tell us about what's going on with the particle collisions, the powers derived, and the particles that they're generating, which are strangelets. They're not going to talk about any of that stuff. So wow. people have asked me, what can we expect to see or hear through during this year as the power ramps up in different levels? Earthquakes, volcanoes, changes in, in the magnetosphere, perhaps more Norway spirals, mm -hmm. we're going to start seeing more of the strange sounds in the atmosphere that we've been hearing, and certainly more animal die-offs. So all of those things are going to be ramping up right along with what they're doing. Well, you guys are my close friends, and this is where I put all my energy is into our show, the three of us getting together. All my research is always tied and focused into what we talk about here each week. Jane Weaver, she says, burn it to ash. That's presupposing that it is comprised of carbon and phosphorus. And interesting that you have focused, Chris, on phosphorus lately. And that when you burn phosphorus, it turns to an ash. It is a light in its, in its um, atomic form. Phosphorus is light. And she's commanding them to burn a robot to ash, but it's comprised of metal and plastic. Therefore, it will not turn to ash. Reduce so. them to ash. Plus, you look at Ash Wednesday in the Catholic religion and the, the cross on the forehead using ash. Um, also, what I take from this is not just the ash, presupposing that it's made of carbon as we are or and phosphorus we're comprised of a uh, hundred different elements but they're focusing on consciousness as well and when we talk about artificial intelligence there's the building of the machinery there's the building of the computer and that's all well and good but as philosophers of old have always tried to pin down and define what is consciousness and that's been the struggle in philosophy for as long as man has been around. How do you define? How do you put your finger on it? From a physics standpoint, how do you create consciousness? That is the elemental question in artificial intelligence. When we get into talking about whether or not a computer is sentient, if it's self-aware, if it recognizes itself in the mirror, does it have a sense of its mortality or immortality? That's being sentient, but is that consciousness? And we can go into a long philosophical discussion, but the point is, to me at least, to achieve a sentient status as a computer, whether it's Chappie or anybody else, you have to have a soul, or you have to have a spirit, however you want to define it. If we are talking about or opening a portal and these host bodies being receptacles for these spirits, be they the artificially constructed host bodies that we talked about in the previous video a little bit ago today, or human bodies that are being prepared through chemtrails or other mechanisms, again, for the reception of spirits into humans that are alive today, and will be alive at the time of the portal being open. Then you have the ability to say, well, those bodies now have a consciousness to them. 
and they are sentient. If we're talking about building an artificially constructed beast and that beast being controlled by a artificially intelligent quantum computer, the 2048, now we have to impart upon that beast a spirit or a soul or a consciousness as well. Hmm. Yeah, that's um, just for people's... Uh, Jacob's ladder. <laughs> exactly, Jacob's ladder. It's interesting. Um, there was another conversation I was having with some people this week, and one of the, uh, one of the, the points was that so few people, when asked, do you know about CERN? Have you ever heard of the Large Hadron Collider? And the comment was from this person who was asking multiple people this question. Many people had never heard of it. Certainly they had heard of the God particle, but when you ask specifically, have you ever heard of the Large Hadron Collider? The eyes just glaze over. So there's been a significant cover-up that's been going on in the form of distraction in the form of movies and television shows. Nobody's talking about this in that popular culture venue. They're keeping it out of the movies. You don't see any movies mm -hmm. on, on that other than Angels and Demons that came out with Tom Hanks back in, I think, 2008 or something. Well, I will tell you then why I watch. So I, let, me, let, me, let me stop you there for a second. I, I want the audience to understand I purposefully keep myself disconnected from all of this stuff. Yes, I went to see Interstellar and you know a few of the other movies, um, Imitation Game, but I haven't owned a television in four years. I don't watch television. I don't watch movies on Netflix. Very selectively will I look at a movie. Now this I Frankenstein I had no clue about. I'm going to go look at that for obvious reasons. But the reason that I have somewhat created this monk-like in you know existence for myself. Yes, I have a regular job and do all those normal things, but it's so that I don't pollute what I believe the Holy Spirit is trying to guide me towards in terms of re research and going down rabbit holes and writing the books that I write. I don't want this infusion of this other stuff to get in there and, and lead me astray. I want to stay on the path, the straight and narrow that he's got me on. So then when you tell me about a movie like I Frankenstein, it just blows my mind because it's right there. I'm not a prophet. I keep telling you guys that stuff, but I'm just trying to reinforce the fact that I'm not pumping myself up or putting myself up on a pedestal. I'm simply saying this blows my mind because then I see the things that popular culture is putting out that reinforce and reconfirm to me that I'm on the right track. No. What, what are they? I said, look straight up. <laughs> and there was a perfect pattern that day. And she said, I don't understand. What do, you, what do you mean? What are we looking at? Aren't those clouds? And, of course, I had to go into the explanation. But you're exactly right. Everybody's looking down. And even if they do look up at the sky, they don't even know what they're looking at. Yeah. You know, there was a question posed to me a couple of days ago, and that related back to CERN and whether or not the machine is even in the Bible mm -hmm. and its activities and the goals and the opening of the portal. So maybe I'm kind of throwing that at you without any preparation, but I, my sense of it is it doesn't have to be in the Bible. It's here and it's part of their agenda. And whether or not it's successful in terms of opening the portal and the spirits coming through or not, um, doesn't have to be in the Bible as far as I'm concerned. I'm on a path right now of researching to see if it is, if it is cryptically or symbolically represented. So I kind of toss it to you guys to do some research as well. Especially, Chris, I mean, you, in the ancient studies, you would be able to answer that better than I could. Tim, I'm sure you are more familiar with Scripture than I am in the modern times. So I throw it to you guys, but I don't think it should discourage us from the path of paying attention to CERN, understanding what their purposes are, and 
yes, the machine is fragile, and they may not be successful in doing any of these things, and none of it may happen this year. But I think that we've connected enough dots to be able to say it does fit with the Bible in terms of the end time activities, um, the opening of the pit in the Bible, certainly I think is CERN. Can you hold that for just a second? Uh-huh. Come back, just one more, come back. So you're saying that in the fourth dynasty was the golden age. No, go forward. Fourth mm -hmm. dynasty was considered the golden age? Mm -hmm. And that was between 2613 to 2494? Mm-hmm. Okay. Hang on, hang on before you go too far. You said that the constellations changed their position during that uh, fourth dynasty? Yes. Okay, that's really important if we relate that to the Thunderbolts project and the alignment of Saturn, Venus, and Mars in close proximity to the Earth. That's when they referred to that alignment at that time as the Golden Age. That alignment was before the constellations and the planets themselves changed position to what we see today. So you just, yeah. pinpoint, you just pinpointed the date of the Golden Age before everything shifted. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Outstanding, outstanding work. So all, yeah, through, um, all through history, the, the swastika has been worshipped, and we've seen the flip side or the inverse of the swastika presented in different cultures. But all through history, they have been seeking the opening of the portal is what the, rep, the representation of the of the swastika means to people and the fact yeah. that you've pointed out that it rotates and specifically rotates around Polaris which is our navigation star, our primary north star for navigation. Everything that we know in the world is based on navigation by Polaris which is the center of the hub of the rotating swastika which opens the portal. Yeah. That's mind-blowing. Yeah. You are yeah. right on top of it, baby. Mm -hmm. Like we talked about it the last time, <clears throat> your your images here tell the whole story. This is the whole thing right here, folks. I want you to understand what she's presenting. This is a graphical representation of the process and the machine at CERN. This goes back to the Golden Age, but it shows the components in in an in a ancient representation, it shows the components of the Large Hadron Collider <clears throat> and its orientation to the moon. And what it is showing you is the connection, pardon my voice, it's showing you the connection that will be established, an electrical connection between the Earth and the moon. And this is reestablishing a connection that occurred during the time of the Golden Age, and as Chris has identified, during the Fourth Dynasty. And this all ties into the uh, Kabbalah tree here, representing the same thing that you're seeing in the middle image. The middle image is the whole the whole game right there. And that's also an image that was provided to us by the Thunderbolts project, showing the alignment of the moon. And uh, as well, <clears throat> we have uh, Venus and Mars and Saturn. So that's where we're headed with this. Chris, you just really, again, hit it right out of the ballpark, right here. Beautiful. Yeah, this... Slide, the Well of Souls. Tim, okay, you're a popular culture guy. Um, we're talking about uh, Indiana Jones. Do you remember in the Well of Souls? <clears throat> and then he places the staff <clears throat> with the with the medallion on the top of it and the, the rays of the sun come through into the right. chamber. Yeah. Um, if we were to do the same thing with this um, this navel, this this well of souls, the, the navel of the universe, and place the staff in that, I'm just my thought here is that it probably points right to, um, well, now Polaris. What do you think? If we look at that stone, <clears throat> excuse me, much like a sextant for navigation, then that, to me, that hole, that navel, has to point to the North Star. 
That's a, that's a that's a good point, especially if we, if that's what it reflects the as above so below. Yeah, because it points to the north star above, but it points to the well of souls below below it. Yes, mm -hmm. and this is and this is where it's it's closely located to Mount Hermon, which is where the fallen angels um, originally had touched down, and that's where there's a UN outpost right now. A military outpost on top of Mount Hermon and that is you know we're looking at territory that's being fought over right now and possibly in September 23rd if we're talking about Mars being over the Giza pyramid mm -hmm. <clears throat> maybe a time of war it may tie into Mount Hermon portal these are four portals and well these are two but they had on the other picture and this is dualism here this Phoenix with the two heads so this is what they want to do is they want to raise the dualism the yin and the yang and put the two together can we stop there for a second yeah um, the portal you're representing there as a um, as a rectangle or they're representing it as a rectangle and the reason that that is significant there's two things Number one, the adiabatic quantum computer, the quantum computer that we've talked so much about that they have built, is housed in a black cube. Um, that extends out into the model of the universe. The model that they're using in what I want to call their public relations campaign, when we talk about the Higgs boson, we talk about quantum particles and smashing particles, or uh, protons together and creating smaller particles. All of that discussion of quantum physics, everything that we have learned in school in terms of physics is based upon Einstein's gravitational model of the universe. Now that gravitational model utilizes right angles in geometry, right angles in rectangles and cubes, and rather than a electric model of the universe which then represents the universe as curved space in the form of a sphere now yeah my, I'm glad that you brought that up okay go ahead so I as you guys know and I can't divulge his name or the project they're involved in but you guys know who I'm talking about already um, I post I, I gave him my theory of the model of the universe being a sphere rather than a flat plane or a cube, which is the cube represents the gravitational model, which is what we've all learned in school. Big Bang, all of that. And I presented it to him because he is a um, proponent of the electric model of the universe, meaning curved space. I said, does a sphere represent the universe and he said it absolutely does and he went down and listed several things to um, prove that so to speak as best as we can prove it so the electric model is different than the gravitational model geometrically in that the electric is a sphere or curved space here they're representing a portal rather than round they're representing it as the gravitational model which is right angles, the cube, or the rectangle. And yet in popular culture, as we know, Tim especially here, we've got typically they re represent a portal as a round gate. So what I'm getting at here is, and this is going to come up in my new book, Coalescence, there is a merging coalescence. There's a merging coming of the two theories, gravitational, cube or rectangle to sphere electrical model the two are complementary the two will merge and in my book I'm kind of giving away the punchline the sphere and the cube merge so I'm not going to say too much because I want Chris to have the floor here today but I wanted to point out why they're representing the portal here as a rectangle because that's the gravitational model and yet we're seeing through here representations of the electric model because of the use of electric plasma in returning and reconnecting things back to the golden age. So it's all pulling together. It's not exclusive. So you're representing the bending, 
the modification of the time space continuum from yeah. what has been forced upon them, which is the square, the cube, to what they want, which existed in the golden age, which was the sphere, which is the portal, allowing them to return to the golden age. So you're seeing the manipulation through all of this power they're generating, 14 tera electron volts. It's not the collisions that's important. It's the power that's generated, which then creates a toroidal field, a magnetic field in the shape of a donut called a torus. And the center of that torus being around, being a spherical center, okay? That is the shape of the portal that will result, not a square, not a, not a rectangle, not a cube, but as you've correctly pointed out here, Chris, it is definitely a donut. It is definitely a sphere in the center of the donut and a sphere as the greater tor toroidal field of magnetic lines of force. That's what they're creating in the center of CERN. It's not particles that are generated. It's power that's generated to create this donut in the center of that point of collision where the streams cross. So it, they're generating magnetic fields. I want people to grasp this. This is a shift from the gravitational model to the electric model of the universe. No one, I'm telling you right now, there is no one who is revealing this. I'm not trying to say we're wonderful and you know, prophetic or anything else. It's just that the three of us have put our heads together for months now. And Chris is pulling this all together. She's taking all the pieces that the three of us have brought to the table. Well, I couldn't have done it. Just chose to destroy the Tower of Babel, which we've related to being uh, the ancient version of the present Large Hadron Collider. I think that everything became imprisoned. I think all of these entities, sure, we have people, you know, that commune with, <laughs> with demonic spirits and whatnot. But I think a prison was created, and I think a prison in the in the form of a cube was created, and they want to break out of that cube, and they want to move back into this spherical realm that existed back in their golden age, and. God is going to allow this. Um, now the, the physicist I was mentioning before that I have been consulting with, he is also a Christian believer. And the statement that he gave to me yesterday was pretty profound in the sense that I asked him the direct question, do you think that they're going to be successful with the Large Hadron Collider in terms of opening the portal? And he said, I can't answer the question about a portal because I don't know enough about it at this point. He said, I understand where you're going with this, and I understand the, the occult um, direction of wanting to open a portal. But from a physics standpoint, he said, I can't say whether they're going to be successful or not. However, from a spiritual standpoint, from my understanding of Scripture and through prayer, God will allow all evil to have its day. Anything that man can imagine, God will allow them to manifest. And the purpose for allowing, the, in this case, the Large Hadron Collider to be successful, and in our thinking here, it's successful in opening the portal, but the reason for their success to be allowed by God is so that all evil can be manifest have its day, and then to be done with it, to bring an end to all evil once and for all, without Satan being able to say to God, you didn't allow me to do as you said I could do, which was to be able to have my day and manifest all that I could dream and conjure and produce. And so it, I'm going to take from from this gentleman because it echoes the things that I have read and I believe they will be successful. Was it, will it be this year? We don't know. 
but they will have their success in all of these occult practices and what the goals are that they are trying to achieve. It sounds depressing, however, it's giving us the opportunity to make a choice, and that's the choice between God and, and Satan. I won't go much further than that, but I just wanted to throw that out, Tim. I think yeah, hopefully I think, that answers your question. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay, so, so he's uh, an alchemist. You said that yeah. Thoth is, is an alchemist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is, that's exactly the process at the Large Hadron Collider where they are actually, as you know, there's publicized articles that they actually changed lead into gold. And their whole, their whole process is guided by the Tablet of Hermes. And part of what is contained in the Tablet of Hermes, which is green emerald, okay, mm -hmm. is the process of changing or the mutation of elements into other elements, not just lead into gold, that's the popular one. But literally at a quantum level, they now have the ability not just through these collisions, but through the acceleration as well of particles, they're able to change the mass energy of solid particles and actually move and change the number of electrons in an atom and therefore be able to change lead into gold by changing the number of electrons that are circulating around the, nu the nucleus. So when you talk about Thaw being an alchemist, obviously there's that direct connection to the Large Hadron Collider at CERN and what they're doing, and the connection to their spiritual practices, which is the motivation behind the building of the machine in the first place. Mm -hmm. they talk about the electrical connection between the planets, between the stars, between the sun and the earth. and if you take that and lay that representation that you're seeing here into that model, those lines all represent electrical connections between all of these heavenly bodies. And when we talk about plasma, plasma represents the greater open field in this, the, the spaces. In the gravitational model, they talk about the empty space, the vacuum, being comprised of dark energy and dark matter. In the electric model, they talk about those spaces as filled with plasma, electrically charged plasma, which is a fourth state of matter, okay? And just like time is, a, is the fourth dimension, plasma is the fourth state of matter. And therefore, these open spaces in this diagram are filled with plasma, and each of these planets in the moon and the earth and the sun are all connected electrically by electrical currents. And so they're representing to you energy. And oftentimes this is related to the human body uh, in the sense of the energy connections within the body itself and the different points within the body. But you can relate that out to the universe as represented here in much the same fashion because we live in a plasma environment and we all of the components of our bodies and all of the components of the heavenly bodies are all electrically interconnected. And so you have, when you're connected that way, lines of communication. You exchange energy and you can exchange information through those pathways. So mm. I wanted to lay that over onto this because it's totally relevant to what we're talking about from a physics standpoint. Okay. Uh yeah, uh, for Chris's benefit, I just wanted to point out that uh, 326 triangle right there. That's the shape of the thing that's in Tony Stark's circular donut. <laughs> oh, yeah. In his, in his chest, because in his, you've, got, you've got dot there as representing the heart. Well, that's mm -hmm. in the center of Tony Stark's chest. So, yeah, yeah. exactly, Tim. Yeah, so that, that just, that's your pop culture crossover with uh, that picture of Iron Man with the triangle in the circle. That's that mm -hmm. right there, dot and that. And your flux capacitor. Glad you mentioned the, the, the folks that are bringing information our way. I want to do a blanket shout out to all of the people that are emailing, not just me, but all three of us. The, the audience is growing and the audience is participating. And I've, the question I've gotten many times is how can we get questions to any of us? And so I would encourage you 
you know, to go ahead and go to our websites and send in your email questions to any of us. And we talk all the time on a daily basis, with the three of us, and we can send messages between each other and forward them on your behalf. But there have been a lot of videos and a lot of articles that have been sent to me personally by people who um, join us here on this discussion. And I'm really, really grateful to the information that we get because it leads us into really critical pathways. And much of what we present here comes from our audience. So mm -hmm. I wanted to acknowledge that. But you're able to, Did to you read have these anything? pictures. You're able to read these pictures like a book. I, one of the, Christine, I'll, I'll acknowledge, I think Christine's probably watching. She sent me an email and said, you know, you guys can read these pictures like a book. It's amazing. And it really, this is what the Lord gives to us. We're not special. Again, we're just the conduits of information. That Take away any personal thing out of this whole discussion here. We're just the conduits of information coming out. But Chris could sit here. She could do three hours just on this one picture of taking this apart and dissecting it and talking about what it means from the ancient stories. And I could sit here along with Tim, and we could do another three hours after she's done talking about popular culture and physics mm -hmm. that's all represented right in here. So maybe at some point we'll just take one focus show, and we'll just talk about and take apart all of these pieces and very quickly just talk about what they represent in physics, pop culture, now that we have Chris's presenting it from a historical, from an ancient context, we could bring this up to the present time, but that would be for a different show. Oh, yeah. There, there's, I just want people to understand that when we're reading this, we're reading a lot of depth into this mm -hmm. because of the research we've done, and we'll try to share that as we go along. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you look at um, shows on TV, Tim, like... Um, those survival shows, and they talk, they show about how to uh, rub sticks together to start start a fire. Right. Or you place the point of the stick into a stone or into a block of wood, and you create friction and you create fire. Right. The uh, the Indians, the natives, would use you know two pieces of well uh, a loop of a thread or a vine around the pole, and they would move that pull back and forth by pulling on that string or on that vine very quickly, creating the fi friction down near the feet of these ah, two figures. Yes. And so you're creating fire here through friction. Right. Well, you're, do you're doing the same thing when you're accelerating particles in a circle. Right. You're jetty, so, as you know, through mm -hmm. friction, you generate heat, generating energy. Same thing with a particle collider. It's spinning just like this rod is spinning and it's creating energy in the form of terra electron volts and that's igniting energy, generating energy through the collision of particles which is a result of spinning them like you're spinning this rod and if you will at the very top of that rod we're looking at the one with the two black figures the top of that rod you have the edge on view of a circle okay imagine looking down on that you'd see a circle we're looking at the edge of that circle, and that circle is being spun by these two figures. Again, wow. the partition at the Hilton, I opened it with the, um, the image of Homer as a scientist, as a physicist, working out the mathematical model for the um, mass energy equivalency of the Higgs boson, and that predated by nine months the actual, not nine months, several years, I should say, predated the supposed proof of the existence of the Higgs boson and its mass energy equivalency was only about 700 um, electron volts off of wow. what Homer had presented in The Simpsons. So I like to laugh about Homer and the donuts, but mm -hmm. here we go. I mean, they put it right out in front of us. Well, I think if um, we have anybody that is you know, going in the direction of um, the electric model of the universe, plasma, if they will focus on the toroidal fields, the uh, magnetic lines of force that are generated by particles under acceleration that then form 
this shape of magnetic lines of force, which is the torus, the donut. Um, this is the key. This is where I'm researching. This is what I'm bringing to a focal point in the book, Coalescence, that will be out in a few weeks. I'm giving it away, but I, I really want people to understand that what is going on below the surface, below the public relations with the heart, Large Hadron Collider, is not quantum physics. It's the magnetic universe, and it's all about the donut. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. You have any final words, Chris? Well, um, yeah, I do. I, I um, you know, I wanted to say hi to one of my friends that's listening.